that's a special day, but the, the potential is out there with the conditions that are setting up the way that it is. <clears throat> well, I what happened today? So I've got I got two things going on. One, I'm gonna try to do this and see if I can do it the right way. Um, I'm trying to I'm watching the Rayburn Invitational at the same time as all this is going on. And so I was going to have Matt on uh, me and Matt had talked to last week or yeah, last weekend. And we were going to talk about the BPT stuff, Toledo bend, all that kind of stuff. And um, he, he, uh, he said, he's got two, two kids home sick today. Uh, so yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a deal. It's crazy. Uh, hey, Nicholas. So keep this in mind. So I'm trying to get so Mullins, David Mullins called me up today. I just bring that up because his knowledge of Dale Hollow, I think, is, is second to none. And uh, he he had something going on today. And then um, I said, hey, what are you doing at 12? He said, well, I got a little I got a phone call he's got to do. And then uh, we'll see. It's David. We'll see if he he takes me back. And uh, he said he thinks he can try to make it on. But I don't know what time it is. So he might just randomly pop up. He said he was going to call me. So I've never been to Dale Hollow. and um, But how do you approach Lake Cumberland? Well, So I've been to Cumberland now twice. The first time is when we had the tour. And um, it was, um, it, I think it was like, what, 14 foot high or something? Whatever. I mean, water's all in the trees. And so then all of a sudden, you know, as we were going around there, I finally like stumbled upon him on a spinnerbait. And it was the most, to this day, a lot of us talk about that. That was the most insane spinnerbait bite we've ever been on. It was phenomenal. It was so awesome to watch, like, like the way they hit a spinnerbait. And, man, I was smashing on him in practice. And then I found these big, giant smallmouth. And uh, I don't know. I, I bet you I had like four or five bites that day that I caught one or two, did horrible day one. Day two, I was so mad, I just rolled out and just went to a whole nother area and found him and caught a really big bag on day two. But I don't know if I, you know, when it's 14 foot high, no lake is poachable the right way. What I did find about Cumberland is, is that, um, it like, <laughs> I always laugh because, you know, I always talk about the no information thing and I always going, hey, like, which way do I want to go, right or left? Well, I went down south and I just went into some, well, we had a house down there. And I didn't realize that that uh, whatever what's the creek at the very bottom end of Cumberland, uh, Tiger is it Tiger? Anyways, yeah, I didn't realize that that's where tournaments get won. You know, like that's the big deal. So, anyways, uh, I went down there a little bit the second time. I guess was the the Toyota Championship, and um, I just. I, I don't know. I just went down there and, and my deal is I just fished everything. And I probably had the best practice I've ever had. One of like top five, top 10 practices I've ever had. Um, and it was just, I was just going down the bank, throwing a top water. And I just absolutely found, I, I, I had, if I just went, I would just catch fish. And I would, I mean, it, by the end of the day, I would catch some big ones. But I found one, or two areas that were pretty good. And then I found one spot. I, I found one spot that it was a lot like a spot on the bank. Like I threw up there and catch a four pound, like a four pounder blew up on it. And I was like, and I, as I trolled by it, there was this like old boat lift on the bank. It was just, it was an old boat lift right underneath the water. And I saw like 10 to 15, like four to six pounders on it. And I was going, well, that's all I need. And uh, anyways, showed up there that first one in the tournament and like freaking four footers. We had a j horrible freaking storm come through. Um, I swear, I still got it on video of like this looks like a tornado coming across the river as I'm driving almost right through it. Anyways, it was uh, it was wild and uh, four footers on it. I caught one fish there. I, I was in the top 10, I think, after day one. But uh, day two, I struggled on. So I don't really know how to explain how I viewed Cumberland. I just knew it goes down on the south end. I went down there and I top watered. I threw out there in 30. I threw up on the bank. I caught a giant on a 6XD. I mean, I did kind of everything until I just figured out what I thought was the best. And to me, the top water deal 
I mean, no one was really doing it. So, yeah. Um, so, I didn't know if anyone wanted to talk about Rayburn, but we'll, we can get into Rayburn whenever. Uh, can I? Can you give me some insight? Yeah, I, the insight. Uh, the insight is like go watch that Bassmaster Open footage. Is the best. I mean, because the deal is, is that the last time I was there was for the tour event four or five years ago. And what I'll say is this: I went two days without basically catching hardly any fish. In practice, we had, I guess, three at the time. Uh, my third day, my third day, uh, I finally got around some. Once you get around them, it's easy. It's easy to get bit once you get around them. And, and what I call easy, it's very hard to catch a fish when they're not around. Okeechobee is a lot like the Great Lakes and or, you know, St. Clair. If you're not around them, you're not going to catch anything. And you'll see groups of boats. And usually when you're around groups of boats, that's where most of the fish are. It, I, I don't like fishing that way. And, and the, the creek I found, there was hardly any boats for it. I was probably a half a mile away from where the tournament was won. And I could see all those boats. But uh, I didn't find those fish. So I found these other fish. And I kind of had it all to myself. I say it was a creek. It was kind of a, a weird little bay creek type deal. But did good enough for a pretty good check. Top 30, top something like that. So, uh, anyway, I didn't really, no, I didn't get set off. It was just, I me, y'all know me. I don't really, I don't get mad at comments, but it, <laughs> so there, listen, I do have fun with comments. I have a, I have a, maybe a mental Maybe I maybe I have like a screw loose, like I'm a little bit uh, mentally. It's not unstable. I just have fun and like there. There's a video on my TikTok that to this day, like last night I was up last night answering comments from a video I did like a year ago on TikTok. That I like I even read my own comments and I'm cracking up laughing because it's so much fun with these people, it, like the people the people that lead. The people that leave comments the way they do are so much fun to interact with. And I there's nothing more fun. And and I ain't gonna lie, I loved when Randy Flowers um was around because when he would do stuff, and there were some things that got out of hand, but when people were like would get on him about his spelling, and then he like they didn't realize that was part of the the shtick. Right. That was part of his deal. And they they would they were serious with his spelling and he wasn't. And they got so furious about that. Like I like nothing that brings me joy to my life. And so when I see when I see that, and when I see guy, I'm like, hey, don't put any numbers. Like, like I understand the numbers. I'm just saying, y'all saw my video. And I was just going, I'm just gonna go make another. I, I can't help it. Like it, it, it actually gives, I have to, I have to, it's too much fun. It's too much fun not to, but yeah. So anyways, uh, how does it, how does your approach to finding fish change on a river or reservoir? Um, it's totally different. Like, like I said, rip. River to me is once again, it's a spot thing. I, I don't know how like rivers are the hardest rivers. Rivers are the hardest thing to do with without info. Like some knowledge of something about a river. Lake, you could give like like I always love going to lakes because I don't want to do the research. I don't want to have to call people or talk to people. And when I say info, not spots, but if you go to a river and it's a hundred miles long, you know, you have to travel a long ways to find this. I love lakes where it's like, there's the lake, go beat everyone else out in the lake. Right. That's what I love. And so I always enjoy that. So rivers, rivers, usually you kind of have to have a little bit of knowledge of like, where do I, where can I, where can I go? Once again, usually once you get around rivers, it's just, it's, if you're in the same spot as someone else, then it's just out fishing them. Chances are, you know, it it's it's not like that. 
you like you usually get beat by someone in a better area, not because um, he outfished you. I'm not taking away from anyone that wins on rivers. I'm just saying that's the way I look at it. Are there any updates? No, I still don't know any updates on the haymaker. Uh, has KVD ever cheated? I, I don't know. Not to my knowledge. I, mean, I don't know. No? Uh, Uh, I, I don't know about the live scope. I, look, I know there's a difference between the transducer. I don't, I, I'm not going to comment on that and tell you which one, like, I, I don't know. I can't, I didn't go from one to the other. And then like on the same unit, when I switched, when I changed over this year, I had a new unit that was a better unit and the transducer I have. So I, I don't know what it would have looked like without it so I, i'm sorry about that once again that's a that's a phone call for like michael yoder and them up at jones marine electronics so i'm watching I, i'm i'm shocked i guess no one i guess anyone that would be watching rayburn is watching rayburn i got it looking at uh okay so look he said it's definitely worth the switch big improvement i would i would take that I would listen to that. Usually, I would say usually when when something new comes out and if everyone's going to it, I would say that's probably what you would need to go to. I had one of those exact same batteries when I was done with it. Used to start a fire. Phenomenal stock. Like that's the thing. It does. It does. Um, it does work as two. Like those batteries are the most unbelievable. Like they will start a fire. Like they, they'll start a fire just about as good as a, a month old Christmas tree. Uh, let's see. The owner jungle is better than the haymaker. Well, one the the jungle flipping hook is a flipping hook and the haymaker hook is an offset wide gap hook so they're kind of not the same thing um so but i will answer this the haymaker so if you're going to compare jungle hooks to other flipping hooks it's good if you're going to compare haymaker hooks to other offset wide gap hooks the difference is a mile like the haymaker is 10 times better than all the rest of them so uh i would say it, i use the haymaker i'll put it this way i use the haymaker to flip and to do everything i would not use the owner jungle too so um i change out the hooks on my hybrid hunter if if i'm fishing a tournament i'm i'm changing out my hooks anyways but yes uh i'm gonna go change them to um the owner is wire hooks they still put number fours on them but yes uh, i do a show on live scope settings i already did one bobby i did one um go go look i got one garment i got i got one on the live scope settings go, go, check it out I, i'm it's it's on my just put in, just go to my page and look at Garmin live scope settings, or it, I have a playlist out too that has all that stuff on there. So already did one. Uh, uh, are you ever concerned about running the tow motor at the same time you are reeling in your line and it scaring? Oh, I, I, okay, hold on. I, I misread that. I thought it was going to be another question. Are you concerned about running the troll motor at the same time you are reeling in your line and it's scaring bass? Yeah, I don't. Okay, well, I, I was I was expecting to be like, are you ever worried about it in your line getting hung up in your troll motor? Um, yeah, I try not to touch the troll motor. Um, so, I, yeah, I try not to touch the troll motor when uh, when that's going on. But I will say. I will say that I, I'm so yeah, 
I try not to, but sometimes you have to. But yeah, I think most of us try not to be on the toll motor when that's going on. Um, if you're far away, it doesn't matter. I think, I think as you get closer, I don't know if it matters whatever you do. Like, like once they get close, it's it's not good. Uh, I agree, it's not a hundred times better if you can't get them, but it's still a hundred times better. Uh, Millican blew out tiny Nakanich. Nakanich has been blown out forever. Um, and he did it all before the rain, and it's gotten a whole bunch of dirty out there. It's going to be like guys catch giants out there all the time, anyways. And we've caught a bunch of tens out there. Um, I can't, I think I caught so I was really nervous when I did the pro team journal out there with Phil Marks on the pop and perch. And, uh, and I was nervous because I knew it was going to happen and, you know, showing, showing us catching 60. Well, it only showed us catching 30, 40 a day out there, but we were catching like six. They can't, they, we had so many fish catches. They couldn't put them all on the show. And, uh, we did it in less uh, four hours, maybe. Well, we, we kind of had to split it up because of rain. But like four to six hours, we did the entire show with like 60 fish catches. It was unreal. I wanted to keep staying out there, but we didn't. Um, I said, hey, man, we hadn't caught a big enough one. And we had caught some like sixes. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but we're going to catch a big one, I promise. And me and Jason went out there the next day and we caught an eight and a nine. And because I was like, hey, man, I catch one over eight or nine every single time I come. I'm usually out there all day long, but I catch one over eight or nine on a frog. But it's been changed. It's changed a lot. but. I don't, man, from what I see with most of these guys, it's just, I don't think it's going to change anything, you know? Uh, yeah, I, like, so no one's asking about Raven. Oh, well, maybe our people now. Um, if y'all want to get into the Raven thing, what's going on with him? It would be cool for you to live stream and see your endpoint. Well, that's, so I don't know how to live stream it at the same time all this stuff is going on i've been listening to it trying to get as much info as i can hear from e whether it be rob newell because i didn't know rob was doing that normally i'd be sending it i sent rob one text message already every once in a while i'll send those guys text message in and, and let uh and just kind of goof around with those guys because every once in a while so and he does such a good job i'm looking at the numbers he does such a good job, but even I've texted JT Kenny and some of those guys from our lakes, they'll text me. What do you think about this? Um, you know, Jody White texted me the other day uh, about what was going on at Raver and what I thought about some stuff. Um, what I'll say is, and I'm looking at the weights, I, I thought it was going to be, so I, I know a lot of y'all don't look, but I mean, like on my social media, I went out there Tuesday. I caught one over nine, one over eight, one over six. And catching fish was not a problem. That was easy. So I am, sh I'm not shocked about, and, and, and let me be clear, all those places were places that um, I hadn't fished all year or like, like the fish had changed a little bit. And so, um, I was checking different things out and kind of figure some other stuff out. What I was shocked about since I was Tuesday, I, I was out there Tuesday with everyone being out there. Of course, I get my phone calls and, you know, guys, are, when I say phone calls, I'm getting phone calls for like my buddy, my old fishing partner, Brent and Russell called me. And I was like, yeah, man, whatever I'm doing, no one else is really doing. And I'm watching and no one else is really doing what I was doing. Um, they're not throwing the same baits. and they're not I, I it listen it's it's kind of hard to tell like but i don't they're not they're not kind of fishing the same type of water they're close but they're not from this now this is just from me listening i'm very nervous like i, I would love to do this stream thing and i'll be brave y'all know me i don't really like saying things that i don't know to be true i say this because listen I, I am very, if I said something that wasn't true and it came on, oh, hold on. We got David. Let's see. Uh, give me 10 minutes. Okay. Join in. Okay. So I might get David here in 10 minutes. 
when this isn't, I'm not going to bring up politics or anything like this. All I'm going to say is this. When these people on the news, and you can, you can, whether it be, I don't want to get kicked off YouTube, but over the past three years, some things have been brought up on the news, right? And that, that like, y'all just, you know, bear with me on this, right? And they said all these things and everyone was all in a panic. And the next thing you know, none of it to be true. And they just, the people that said all that, just, they didn't lose their jobs. They don't apologize. They don't do nothing. It's just, well, I said it. And then next thing you know, there's no repercussions. I'm not saying they had to get fired, but it's not like I would be so embarrassed. Like I like I would be shunned. Like I'd be like, I'd like walk around like this all day, right? If I said something so outlandish and so wrong with such fire behind it. And then I have to come up there the next day like nothing ever happened, right? I don't want to do this on Raven and talk about Raven about what I think is going to happen. I can, but I want everyone to know first off that I'm like, it's just a thought. And I'm, man, I could be wrong. Like, I don't mind telling you I might, I might be wrong about something about fishing on Raven because like a lot of times what we think is going to happen, we're wrong, but I would do my best. Um, I thought, I thought most people were going to go live scope Raven. The lake's really, really muddy. And usually people still like to go up north. I heard them say that, man, not many people went above the bridge. And I was like, wow. Because I wouldn't have. But I was like, man, who knows what people think? So I was I was kind of right on that. I know y'all didn't hear it, but in my head, I thought I heard that. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. I thought people were going to catch fish pretty easy. I think small ones you know guys were going to catch a lot of small ones and that's what it looks like the weights and, and and here's the other thing i'm looking at the weights and what i mean by that is is i don't ever really go off the top 10 the top 10 look fairly good uh on weights wise what i'll say though i'm seeing what 10th place is 10th place is 16 pounds 16 pounds is a pretty good weight on Raven. it's not a bad weight by yourself I haven't even got to the, my main point yet. Plus, it's 1222, right? So, I mean, you have you got 16 pounds right now at 1222. You're feeling pretty good. They did, they had a fog delay this morning. Um, the morning time is very, very, very important for, for like that's a that's probably one of the easiest ways to catch a giant. So, some giants did not get caught today because of the morning time, right? They missed that window. So the weights would be higher. So if the weights don't look look as high today it's probably because of that now the scoping thing uh I man it's hard to scope when it's 20 mile an hour winds and the brandon belt had like 15 mile an hour winds this dead glass out there so like the scopers are, are in like hog heaven right now they've got like the best day to do it um i think and and we do this a lot based off of like team events and so when you look at team events and guys have 17, 18 pounds in the grass, there's two people. I mean, you could go out there and catch 15 pounds all day long and your fishing partner catches one five pounder and you got 18, right? So um, there's a big difference between 18 and 15 about being by yourself. These are guys that are from there too, right? Now, they are in the middle of the week. It's a Friday. And Fridays are, I'm just telling you, Saturdays are get harder because you get a lot more tournaments and people out there and whatever um drew gill caught another one drew from listening to everything drew said now i haven't listened to everything in everyone said i've 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 seen drew drew is i would say closer to what i would think it, it seems like he's on the right track it seems like he's looking at it in the way i'm looking at it um so I think Drew's going to be tough. Drew also is in a different part of the lake, I think is what he said. And what I mean by that is, is I don't think he's with, he, he made a comment. Now, I don't know where Drew is, but he made this comment. He said, um, 
I, I know where the majority of the fish are, but the majority of the boats are there too. We talk about this on Rayburn. There are parts of the lake on Rayburn that we practice at times, and we're hoping there used to be, years past, there used to be a lot of fish there. And, and there's like the schools of fish, you, like you can have a phenomenal day there, and then you go there the next day or in the tournament day, and they're not there. And you, and you, you go really downhill quickly. Like you can't save yourself there because the population of fish is not as big. So what I, we mean by that is, is a, if you have a big population of fish in certain parts of the lake, it's a easier to save yourself with a 13, 14 pound bag, 15 pound bag. If, if not, you know, it, it, you can weigh in 10. Now, you, now your practice might've been phenomenal, but we've seen that in certain parts of the lake and we kind of stay away from those because it'll bite you, you know? So I, now I don't know where he's at. Right. And I, and I doubt Drew will admit that he doesn't know Rayburn. Like I know Rayburn. So maybe, maybe it's not that big of a deal. I just don't know. So I listened to him. Um, and, and what I saw was, is the live scope, the, the catching fish on live scope was freaking just catch fish. Like that was easy. Um, you catch two pounders all day long. Three a three pounder live scoping was a was a was a was a, was a well above average fish. In the sense of, you might have to catch ten to fifteen to get one three pounder. Um, that being said, that's that's the three pound deal. Now catching a big one is pretty much the same deal. So like when I was out there, I caught some big ones doing it, but I, it's not like you catch a whole like. Your first five might weigh 25. Your second five might weigh 11. Does that make sense? Because we always kind of go by that. So um, now they don't need – Dakota was on there talking about how there's going to be some 25-pound bags. There might be. And I don't know. I, I don't know how many people right now, 97 people have talked about catching a fish. No, 99. So – I don't know if everyone's doing that whole weighing them in. They made a comment that there could be penalized for, for not using the scale, but maybe they only gave the scale to certain people. Maybe and maybe if I go to the end of the comments, someone will talking about that. But so so far, I haven't seen that. Um, all right, I'll try to catch up. Someone asked about jerk baits. No, I don't. I mean, I, I fish jerk baits, but I'm not this like jerk bait guru. So I mean, I because he was asked about suspended dots and stuff, and I just get a jerk bait and just throw it, you know. Um, when do I use haymaker? That's a lot. So um, just go to any of my hook video. I've done a bunch of stuff about hook videos, and uh, that is on there. I talk about that a lot. My last hook video was about the cutting point. Uh, so I think if you just type in tie cast line and hooks and they'll come on there. Ever thought about doing a deep water type series on the mountain grass lake? Yeah, yeah. I don't pick, I don't plan on doing deep waters or Alabama waters. I, I do them on tournaments and they just so happen to be grass lakes. Like I was going to do the, you follow one, right? I had it all. I had like, literally I had, I had put all my footage all together. It was all, and when I say put it together, um, I have to put it all together before I start editing. So i would had every day ready to go. I, I had, I had, there's a system I have to do to it all, to, to, to do it all. And then they put out the schedule that had you fall uh, for the Bassmaster Open and the Toyotas. Now at the time I didn't know I was going to do, I wasn't going to do the Bassmaster Open. Maybe I still do it. I don't know. But the Toyotas came there and I'm like, man, I'm just not putting it out. Um, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just not, I'm not going to, and I've always been on, y'all know me. I'm honest about that. I'm not going to, to do that, uh, sometimes. Cause like I could put it out there and I know it's great, but man, I might lose like 10 grand in the deal and it's just not worth it at the time. Now I got it and I put, might put it out later. I might put it out after this year, but yeah, it, it's not, a, I don't plan. I just have to have all the footage. It all has to kind of work out. You know, um, leaders offshore, no, 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 
driving on top of fish, short reelings. Yeah, I mean, let me see. Give me a Mullins is almost there. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, the live scope, like there, there's a way to live scope some big ones up right now. And I don't know when I say Drew Drew Gill's close to what I think you can be doing. Um, other guys might catch one here and there, but I think to catch multiple, like you can always catch one live scope and randomly. Uh, I'm not really talking about today. I'm talking about over, over the next three days. You better be on a, a on a kind of a plan to do it. You can get lucky and catch one, but um, that's Rayburn. I mean, there's gonna be guys catch freaking. There's gonna be a guy go out there and catch. 40 fish on a rattle trap and catch a 10 pounder, right? I wouldn't count on that to do that every day, right? Uh, Nick's LeBron's obviously catching the ones you want to catch. If you're going to go do that, he's catching good ones, you know, in, you know, like the, like normal good ones in there. And then now if he catches a 10 pounder, now it's totally different. Like it's not as random because he's catching decent ones with it. Uh, the other day he said, Carolina Reagan, two foot of water. Do you keep the leader links the same? Yeah, I'm doing, um, I'm going to give it away, but I, I'm doing a Carolina Rig video shortly. I would highly, highly suggest watching it. What I'll say in this, I think everyone, everyone overanalyzes the Carolina Rig. They put way too much thought into it and stuff like that. Do you keep the leader? Absolutely. I keep the leader the same all the time. And I couldn't tell you what it is. I couldn't tell you the, how, how many inches it is or what. All I know is, is when I hook my, my hook onto my reel and my weight comes up my rod, that's how, that's how long I know it should be. I don't like measure it out. I just kind of guesstimate. And if I'm within about a foot, if it gets too long, I'm like, ooh, my weight's too high up on that. And I know it's going to be a harder thing to cast. And if it's too short, it just looks stupid. I just don't like a short one. Like it, like it looks like I don't know what I'm doing. Like you ever see one, like one of them little short, where is it? One of them little short Carolina rigs. So I'm just like, that doesn't make sense either. So, um, I can answer this. You, okay, for two two things. One, not they're not selling them. So many of these baits are not sold to guys like you. And so if 75% of the guys um, don't care about hooks, they're never going to change hooks. They're going to put the same hooks on there, right? Just put hooks that are decent enough. Anyone that wants to put premium hooks on there and split rings, one, well, I'll get into the split ring thing. I, I don't ever change split rings. I've never had problems with split rings in my entire life on any bait except, except one thing. But for the most part, um, hooks. Like, if you put premium hooks on there, and I like the owner's O wire hooks, and I'm and I still want to throw the owner's O wire hooks, then I'm gonna put my owner's O wire hooks on there and ch even take off the premium hooks on there. And and you probably have a preference, Robert, for your premium hooks, and you want to put those on there. And so I think that the thought process is this: 90, 75 percent of guys aren't going to change the hooks. The guys that are going to change it to the ones that they prefer, anyways. And so. There's a lot of premium hooks out there. It's it's not worth it's not worth then charging a dollar more for every bait, right? And then everyone else, the the seventy five percent guys, right, are are, are not going to be happy. Does that make sense? You know, um, the only time I would ever the only time I'll ever change out a split ring is if it is a single treble hook, and there was only like two baits in the country that I ever even threw that. Um, fit that category and i don't throw them really anymore because they that, i think that was the first other they were swim baits and yeah because you could unravel a split ring but for the most part and i'm sure guys are going to get on here but i'm like i don't know i think i've thrown a lot of baits in my lifetime and i've never really had a problem with split rings ever um all right i answer that No, so do so. Do you think live scope videos? No one really shoots. No, don't find it odd at all. The 
I talk so much about non-reality. Oh, okay. L listen, my video on Monday. I'm not going to put it out Sunday. Normally, I put it out Sunday. But Monday, because um, the Super Bowl is on Sunday. I talk about a little bit about like learning how to use live scope and stuff. I talk about this all the time about not fake video. They're not fake videos. But this is what all these videos like this. They're doing that because now I'm going to make a video about this social media and videos and all these things. I look at so many different things. And the number one thing I look at live scope is I, I check. The first thing I see is where's the range? How far out's the range? And they show these beautiful videos, right? Watch this. Hey, I'm on, I'm doing a live podcast right now. So no, hurry up though. What do you need? What, what, what you got? Or can I call you back? No, yes, it's, it's safe to run up there. Okay. Yeah. No, you're good. All right. So uh, that was a guy from FLW. <laughs> they were trying to run Rayburn. And so he was asking if it was safe to run where he was asking. So anyways, uh, yeah, they don't, right. They don't like me that much at FLW, I guess, but they, ha you know, those guys all do. Maybe the top guys don't. But anyways, um, I always check that stuff out. I always check out to see because all the pictures are going to look good at like 30 feet out. And that's how they're trying to sell it for y'all guys. And it's all, and then you get out there and you're like, that, then you're like, look at yours and it doesn't look like that. There's so many things that happen. Like I always tell people, man, like they're not being, it's not that they're not truthful, but it's not reality. None of us go out there and, and fish at 55 foot out. N none of those guys on, none of those guys right now. I'll bet, a, I'll bet a lot of money. This is the one thing I'll bet money on. Not one of those guys that's freaking out there in the top 20 live scoping has got it out 55 foot. They all got it out further. So why do you care about a video if it's at 55 foot? If that's not what you're ever going to do. But they don't, they, most people don't look at that. Right? I'll give you another one. When side imaging came out, every side image video you've probably ever seen was a video done within the first month of when they own side imaging. Anyone that has side imaging will, will tell you that their picture quality over time gets worse. Right? So a lot of times you're looking at yours and you look at this, this video put up and like, yeah, my screen, my, my screen, mine doesn't look like that. Well, it's not brand new. I'm telling you, you go out there brand new, like day one, man, it looks phenomenal. Right. Um, I will say live scope though. I've had it for a year. I, man, it, it looks the same to me. Now I've never hit it on anything or anything like that. And it's, and remember, it's not, it's not in the water. You're not running around with it. I mean, you're running around you're like it's dragging across stumps and all kinds of things. I don't know, you know, your side imaging transducer, but I've never that I'm just telling you, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't surprise me at all. It's what I talk about that you have to all this social media and YouTube stuff. It's why I try to do things without so much of, and maybe that's why I don't have subscribers like some people, these guys have, right? Because I'm, I'm trying to be truthful about the reality maybe it's not it's not truthful it's like what reality really is right that's what i'm saying so uh i think it is better coverage than bpt on toledo by the way um oh and how would toledo compare to uh, rayburn in a few weeks for the elites i don't know how it'll compare to rayburn they're going they're going, I'm not saying they're going to catch them better. It's going to be way more fun to watch the elites than the BPT. Um, one, and, and listen, this isn't a knock on the BPT. This is this is saying it's going to be within a couple of weeks. There's going to be a whole bunch more fish shallow. So it's you're going to have, there's going to be a better chance to win the tournament shallow. And the fact that it's a five fish deal. 
which is going to make it so both you got two scenarios making it to where it's going to be more fun to watch it go down shallow if guys are not really excited about the whole live scope thing you know uh people lost their jobs because of media spread not all of them so uh youtube is doc talk on steroids look man i that's yeah i don't watch a lot of stuff on youtube i really don't i don't in 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 i say thing i'm sure there's some guys on here that like why is he saying this again um because there's even and, and don't don't take any no one take any of this the wrong way but you're like hey todd why, why don't you do something like this um like like the garmin settings so like i do like i don't know that much about youtube but like just enter my name and then put in what you're looking for chances are i've done a video on it so like i've done one on garmin live settings i've done one on the i've literally almost done one on the hooks the difference between the haymaker and the cutting point and so um i say stuff over and over again so because you know not everyone watches this but but what i will say is is you know how many times i'll i'll say hey guys are probably putting this up on youtube and then someone will be like oh he's referring to this no i'm not i'm really not someone said that the other day oh he's referring to this guy and i'm like never watched that guy's stuff i'm probably pretty good at calling it because i know what people want to like i know how people do stuff and so yeah don't ever think that I'm like, oh, I watched a video and be like, yeah, I'm calling that guy out. I'm not. I just know how people do stuff. And I'm like, yep, yeah, I'm never going to do. It's very easy. It's kind of like I'll put to you this. It's kind of like it's kind of like if you deal with cheaters enough. Right. And you hear about. You hear about guys bending the rules so bad that once you hear about it. It makes you think about it. And you're like, oh, well, how would. If, if this was the case, like, so, so say a guy was cheating, like, well, how was he doing it? Well, I don't know. Right. And so if you ever kind of figured it out or thought about it for a while, it makes you like get in that freaking crazy mindset. I don't know if he's, he's not, he's trying to get in. And so you start thinking about it in a different way. Oh, you're going to love this. David, this is great. I, we really weren't, but he was talking about YouTube stuff. So, anyways, guys, if if you think I'm talking about some video, I'm probably not because I I'm I don't have time to watch it. David, I can promise you, half the stuff I'll I'll call up David every once in a while, or he'll call me up and we'll start talking about stuff. And David doesn't know anything. He probably doesn't even know there's a tournament going on in Rayburn. I actually didn't know that one, but anything YouTube related, I would I couldn't tell you. Right. Well, I can tell you that it's not – I can tell you if I was not in the top 20 on Rayburn right now, if I was fishing, I would be getting a text message from David asking me why I didn't fish the tournament. He loves texting me if I don't freaking make a top 10 somewhere and go, hey, I guess you didn't fish this thing. Well, Rayburn and Toledo, that, that it should be, shouldn't it? Look, so I didn't I didn't get to tell you why I'm not fishing it. Um, I Let's thought about it. it. Well, I thought I, I like I called I called up David Fennell and I was like, hey, man, uh, what's the possibility of me even getting in it? You know, I wanted to see that. So he said pretty good, like real good, obviously. Yeah. And so I was like, all right. And so I was like, when's off limits, things like that. Well, uh, me and Russell had a Bass Champs and a Brandon Belt tournament. Uh, the Brandon Belt tournament was free. Uh, and there was two, so there was two tournaments that I would miss with him. And, um, I thought about it for a while and, and, you know, it, it, it affects him too. Cause we had both planned on fit, you know, we'd set up our tournament schedule months earlier. And so, you know, I just don't like, I don't like screwing over my buddies, you know, right. and I wouldn't have screwed him over, but I mean, I just, I, and I also didn't want to miss out last year when I went out there, I didn't, I kind of figured out some things and I, I knew I'd miss like a month of, of not practice, but being able to fish in January. 
And so um, I really wanted to kind of learn more than fish this tournament. Do I wish I was out there? Um, yeah, probably. I mean, who wouldn't? Right. But I'm not, so. Especially on your home pond. Yeah, but so, so, so I will say a lot of guys talked about that. My first ever tour, uh, we got to fish a tour event on Rayburn. I, so I learned this long time ago. You know, I, I guarantee you can say uh, agree to this. If you ever start circling lakes like for next year, like oh, I'm going to catch them right here. Usually, your worst tournaments. Yes, and let me tell you something. When I fished the tour on Rayburn, it was a high, it was a uh, 11 foot high. They almost had to cancel it. It was almost going over the spillway, and every local bit of local knowledge I had of that was thrown out the window. I yeah. actually did horrible. Um, and so I've learned that like sometimes though, I've won events like that, but I always tell people, I'm like, man, you just don't ever discredit mother nature. I mean, he will throw a, you know, and so this lake's come up five foot in the past, uh, two weeks, maybe, maybe six foot, mm -hmm. I think six foot actually. And so uh, when I went out there Tuesday, I went out there Tuesday because we fished that Brandon Belt tournament and it had come up three foot since then in like five days. So I, I wanted to kind of stay on top of things. It finally leveled out um, over the last day and a half, I think. But, and I did smack, like I will admit, like I caught them. Like I caught, like I didn't, I caught, I caught them. It, it some big ones. It was pretty awesome. But like nice. I said, these guys are gonna. These guys are gonna. Uh, they're doing probably what I thought. I think tomorrow their weights will go higher for some because they'll get that morning bite. Yeah, I actually watched some of it this morning. What'd you think? Well, about about what I thought it'd be. Some people scoping, some people fishing grass. You know, you know. It's more than I more than I usually watch. This is I'm kind of almost ready to fish now because I've had so many months off. Keep keep going, David. Go ahead. So yeah, I can't. I need I need my months off fishing because I can't hardly handle this. For me, I need downtime. I need like that whole duck season for me is so key because I don't pick up a rod and reel from October to January. So that, for me, it gives me downtime and I get to re recharge a little bit. Keep going. Yeah, I'm just talking about recharging, man. I I, I, I was saying I, I need the downtime from October to January to duck hunt just because I just I got to get away from fishing. Yeah, no. So there's there's um some of y'all are like that. Yeah, I'm not. You like to fish all the time. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but see, like y'all travel. I see. I don't know if it would be the same. If y'all, if you didn't travel as much, when you mm -hmm. travel, when you travel and come back home, you don't want to, um, it's hard to get back out there. But yeah. I, I noticed, I noticed I, I fished way less when I fished the tour and traveled a bunch. Like when I fished the opens, God, when I came home, I didn't want, I didn't ever want to even hook up to my boat. Yeah. But now that I'm home a lot and fish more locally, I want to fish more, way more. Our, our lakes are so terrible now, like Douglas and Cherokee and uh, Loudon and Watts Bar. They're so awful that, like, I don't even want to fish on the home just because you go ahead and you grind out there on the tournament trail to get you, you know, some some bites. And, like, you don't want to come home and fun fish to catch three to six fish all day, you know. So I, I don't even hardly go anymore to our lakes. Do you not have any cool um, – because some guy, one of the first questions I had was, like, how do you approach – um, Dale Hollow and Cumberland okay. as opposed to Rayburn. And I, and I was like, Oh my gosh, that, cause I didn't even let, to, you know, no one even knew if you were coming or not. So I was like, man, that's the question for freaking Mullins, not me. Well, every tournament now seems to be that all you have to do is, uh, you get you a Garmin live scope and you turn it on and you go till you find one. And that don't matter. That's, that's if, it's if you're Okeechobee now, if that's at your Dale Hollow and that's Cumberland, if you're at St. Clair, it just seems like it's amazing to me that the the fish, like if you watch Scott the other day win that Bassmaster Open, which I thought was pretty impressive, yeah. the way the way he caught them bed fishing on that deal, look at every tournament now, that's that's just what you do. But yeah, if I'm at if 
but I'm at Dale Hollow, which is probably the best fishery in our state other than Watauga right now. If I'm at, if I'm at Dale Hollow, I'm probably going out there and looking for some roaming on some bait or, you know, in some of those guts or something. What, you know, what? If it still warms up, then that's one of the best jerkbait lakes I've ever been to, but uh, just a great lake. Can't go wrong going there. What Do you all not have, like, good – so, like, you went to Lake Nack with me. Remember? I, yeah. Is that what, oh, yeah, yeah, Nacogdoches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you went there with me. Um, what, what were you down here for? Um, I, I don't remember what I did yesterday, so I can't. Okay. I can't well, you were down for something, and you were like, hey, let, like, we went and fished. And that was, was when – I won't even talk about it, but that was when you had your first bite, like your first yeah. like true. Yeah. 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 That that kind of rethought like changed what you thought about some things. Mm -hmm. and, and then um, do you know how to have places like that? No, there's really the only place that's got grass, uh, I think it's coming back on Chickamauga. I think it's coming back on Watts Bar a little bit. Del Hollow's got no, no, a no, no, no. Not grass, but you have like lakes, like like little pond, like little Little twenty five hundred lakes that are like not on this end of the state. They got some west west side of the state. Uh, like uh, if you ever watch or read Bass Times or Bass Master Magazine, they have the day on the lake with the pro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all those all those lakes are in West Tennessee, middle to West Tennessee. Okay, they, they do all those articles on. So yeah, there's some, but they're not not to my knowledge none in my area that I know of. That's tough because we have so like right now like. Oh, is going off. Right. And then there's this other D DB Thomas going off and like guys are up there catching like 10 pounders every day. And, um, I looked at, I didn't even realize where the other one was. And it was like six and a half hours away. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And then, and then we got like Lake Nack is like 15 curve, Pinkston, Nack and each. They're all less than maybe 35 minutes. The furthest mm -hmm. for me. I no doubt I can catch a 10 and every I've caught a 10 out of every one of those places. I'd say I've caught some of those. I've caught like 20 over 10 in some of those like Lake Nack. I've probably got like 10 over 10, but I've got like a lot of those. And then I went to Rayburn and I caught 11, 13 the other day and then one almost 10 uh, Tuesday. So it Rayburn is like far to me. Like I would never go to Rayburn to fun fish. Right. That's, what's, that's the crazy part. I don't go to, so I, I was only going to Rayburn to practice because we've got um, a TXTT coming up and a Toyota coming up all starting next weekend. So I just go there for practicing because even when I'm there, like I don't sit around and catch fish. Like I'm always just looking for more and more fish, you know, but like these other places, <laughs> It's just it's just crazy to me because you have to bring up Dale Hot like you're bringing up Cherokee and these lakes that you live by, and like I said, I would never go to Raven for fun. Yeah, I would. Act, I would prop if 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 Del Hot was close because that's about two hours, maybe two and a half hours for me. The first check I ever got in my life in the BFL was on Del Hollow. but if I was going to, if I lived closer, I would definitely probably go there and fun fish because it's a good lake. It's just too far for me to drive. And, yeah, you know, I don't. I don't feel like dealing with it. But yeah, I'll, yeah. Most of our lakes now are just fishing so poor. I can remember, like Douglas, it always took twenty plus to win there. There was a tournament uh, last week or something. Maybe took twelve. You know, yeah. and like Cherokee, it always took around twenty, not eight high teens to twenty pounds. I mean, we we've, we've weighed in twenty three, twenty four in February there before back in the day, and now. If you've got 14, you've done real good, you know. So it's just they're not they're not even worth fishing anymore. And I'm not sure why that is, but they're just uh, they're not very good. Right. And so this Nick guy wants to know how he can get a get a hybrid hunter down to eight feet. I guess with some lead strips, maybe. Nah, lead strip. we, we got we got uh I agree with them. I agree with them that it's it's cool to get a tape foot. We we're working on something. It's kind of been back and forth on, 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 it's a lot that goes into it, but I mean, we're working on something. Uh, I like he, he has won the most money on that bait outside you though. You see well, that? So he says. That's, that's a lot of money. 
That's that's he he might be right. It could be. But he's throwing the junior. See, it's hard for me to like. I've thrown the junior. I bet you I never even threw the junior last year. How deep will the junior die? Four and a half to five. Four and a how half. Deep, how deep will the regular hybrid hunter die? Yeah, man, I don't even like saying stuff like this on because the, there's going to be guys get on here. I I I I, I view it probably. It's kind of like me asking you about a crankbait. How deep can you get a crankbait? And that's a loaded question, isn't it? I mean, I can tell you. Well, I, well, yeah, but it's a loaded question. But I already know you. How, how far can you throw it? Exactly. So it's like, so on my setup, and if I'm going to throw the hybrid hunter, I'm not going to sit there and go, well, I can put it on 12-pound test line and get it eight inches deeper. You could, but I'm not going – like, if mm -hmm. I have to do that, it's probably – I, I'm probably not going to worry about it, but yeah, five foot, five and a half, maybe. I remember telling Copley the story about us catching him on a ten. He said, "I can deep you get a ten, like twenty seven. I said, "Copley, we had the wind at our back one time, and there was a school in thirty two, and I caught him every cast with a ten. Yeah, and the, the top of that was thirty two foot. So it's just you it depends, think, on, depends on how far you can throw it. You get a you get a ten mile an hour wind in a ten XD and get to going with it. Oh yeah, you can. You like." That six XD is the same way. Like I'll get out there and and like I always like about a three three to five mile an hour wind, like a little wind, because I don't one I like to crank when it's calm. I don't like really cranking when it's windy. But I mean, you just get that little wind, and it's like you can get you can get 20, 25, 30 more feet easy. Like eat like well, maybe way more than that. Maybe like fifty foot. You talking about yards of the cast or feet of the cast? Feet of the cast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can get you can get it. I mean it. And you can feel it too when you like sling it out there. Like, oh, that's well, like we'll be out there fishing, and like one of those casts, and we're like, oh, got a hold of that one. I mean, because it'll just mm, just keep going. Yeah, you almost have to stop it, especially when the six X D gets a little bit of water in it, and then it really gets to going. Yeah, good. But I, dude, I can remember like there's a funny story when we fished Chickamauga for the first time in the Elite Series, and I think uh, I don't remember what year that was, fourteen, fifteen, or something. And that's when they had the bass thing, the bass fest deal. And anyway, I, I didn't do any good in Chickamauga because I did not know. It's the first time I've been on Chickamauga. And I did not know how small that place fished. And I was like, I just can't pull up on people. And, pull, and I didn't know enough places out of the way to, to, to do well. So we had to go over to Nickajack. And if you didn't make it through that tournament, you could go to Nickajack and try to fish your way back in to fish Chickamauga to get a check. And I remember going to Nick and Jack, and you know, back in the day, we were cranking. We had, you know, DD twenty twos. We had uh, three quarter ounce hot lips, Lure Jensen hot lips, and uh, DT sixteen. Maybe they were kind of newer at that time. I'm trying to think what else the old school plugs that we used to throw a lot. It's fat free shads, you know, the Mold Mark Davis ninety fives. I like, like the fat freeze. And I can remember pulling up on a hole at Nick and Jack, and. Those fish were in uh, 20, like 21, 22. And I couldn't get a 6XD to them. As far as I could throw it, like I could hit 20 with a, with a 6XD pretty regularly. But it was just like they were on certain this little certain lip, and I couldn't get it to bounce. And I'm like, dude, I know what I can pull out. And I'm like, I had a whole box of like three-quarter ounce hot lips I hadn't thrown in like 10 years. And I remember pulling those things out. And, dude, I couldn't throw that thing from one end of the boat to the other. And I'm like, how in the world did I catch so many fish for all those that years? That thing's light, too. Yes. And I'm like, how did I catch so many hundreds on that thing back in the day? And uh, finally just pulled out a 10 and caught them every cast on a 10. So so I, I fished a lot of those because when I was younger, growing up on Livingston, a guy named Ken Seifert was one of the uh, main uh, Lure Jensen sales reps. So I used to get the, those. And then the they were – the. They made the deep one, and then they called. They made one like the br baby, the br the brush. What was it? The baby brush something. It had like little uh, little. Oh, on little, the lower jeans. Yeah, yeah. They had a little fin on the outside of the belly. Uh, they yeah. were called. Anyways, uh, yeah, I called them on Livingston back in the day. I brought this. Listen, I brought this comment up because I. So I wanted that. So yeah, Mullins doesn't fish a lot and comes out rusty. What I was going to ask about you being rusty. So when you, when, so when you came in, listen. So when you came in second in angle of the year, three yeah. years ago, was it three years ago you came in second angle of the year? I don't know. I about won it two out of the last three years. Yeah, no, 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 no. So like three years ago, you came in second. 
you were leading pretty much from the beginning. Oh, the, right? yeah, led into the last term of the year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then the next cool. year, you almost won Angler of the Year. I think you were you were leading Angler yeah. of the Year from the get go, weren't you? Like from the uh, first two tournaments of the year. Uh, the, no, the next, the next year after the AOI deal, I go to Florida. I go to Florida and I get to my first spot and my trolling motor, uh, the prop breaks. And I didn't have I didn't have a spare. And luckily I was only like five miles from the ramp. And since then I've, I've got a spare. So I drove back to the ramp. They put me on a spare. It didn't take five minutes, you know. I drove back to that spot and didn't get any bikes and tried to get up on pad and my motor wouldn't run. And I couldn't figure out what was going on, what was going on, and it wasn't getting any fuel. And I look back and there's just fuel going everywhere in the back of the back of the water. So anyway, long story short, I never got to fish that day because I got to troll down the bank to a dock, which had a little small private ramp. And Scotty Mercury at the time um, came down and finally got down there at like one o'clock. And he uh, he fixed my motor and there was a there was a loose connection that I couldn't I couldn't get to that was like up and under something and he ended up uh, patching it all back worked fine so I didn't get to fish the first day so I zeroed the first day of that tournament it was the next year after where I went down had a I ended the year with a top ten I had a top ten in the classic I had a top ten the first tournament at at uh, St John's and I had a top ten at Harris Chain and that's where I led it and. Yeah. I was in second going maybe into the last term of the year that year too. So those back to back those back to back top tens was a little rusty. You should have should have done a little bit better. Dude, I well, I know I'm just saying, like, I remember that because I was like, man, oh freaking David went down to Florida and is freaking coming out hot. If you if you're gonna sit here and respond to haters, your your life's I don't think they I don't think they were hating. I think, you know. Uh, anyways, my job is just go out there and do the best I can. That's all. I, I do. Well, so this all started with me talk. Uh, so my last video was me talking about haters. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, it wasn't, it was, I did a battery video and it really wasn't even that bad, but they're like, man, they got you all riled up. I'm like, no, I just, I have a, David don't even want, David will respond to, to in a certain way. Like you do some funny stuff too. But they got you. I, I'm not going to. I'm just saying we respond in our own ways. I used to respond a lot more, but anymore, I'm just like, you know, it ain't my job to respond to some of this stuff, you know? Well, I was saying, like, I'm telling you, man, I have, I have this video on TikTok that's freaking. It's, I showed it to my mom last night because she was, she had to sign some papers or whatever. So she was in here and I showed her this video. And of course, she's just like, she's a country girl, you know? And she yeah. was just like, oh, okay, you know? And then uh, I started reading responses to her. And she's like, what is wrong with these people? I'm like, well, and I'm over there. It was late at night. And I was like reading off all my responses back to people. Yeah. And she was like, Todd, Brittany hates it. Brittany gets so, you know, you can imagine like no fun Brittany. Like she's just like, well, just leave those people alone. And I'm like, no, that's great. All my buddies, I screenshot them. I screenshot them to like, we got a, this big thread going and I screenshot my responses to people and yeah. they freaking just, they're like, please don't ever stop. And about every once a week, I get a new, someone comments on it and I get to respond to them until, because I will respond to the, if you respond to me 50 times, I will respond 50 more times. I, I will not stop. And yeah. they have, they all eventually quit. And it's, it's, I was dying laughing. It's, it's great. So every once in a while, I'll make a YouTube video in response to that and one was the yesterday yeah let's <laughs> have fun with it uh, that's about all you can do or just yeah. not pay attention to it but i'll try to i'll try to not come out rusty rusty there nancy i'll, hey, be, so I'll try to do better for you i have my own thought on i i've come up with my own thought about all this because it's every lake is like this and yeah, uh, what he says is it post COVID fishing pre or fate. Now, there's two to me. Well, he said fishing worse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're fishing. Yeah. Uh, well, for for Douglas, and I'll speak on Douglas. Uh, 
you know, back when I was growing up from about 2000, from 99 to about 2004, that lake, if you had 14 or 15, you were doing pretty good. If you, if you remember the uh, mega bucks that uh, mm. Nick Klein won on, on Douglas, you know, he only had maybe 13 to 14 pounds a day to win that deal. And then it went through a cycle where it was just a lot of big fish in that lake for, I don't know, a long time. I mean, it, it was like everybody. I, I can remember a tournament in 2000. Well, I'm going to say 10, maybe. I had 21. This was in March. I had 21, like 25, and I finished 20th. That's how good the Blake was fishing. So we cycled through a bunch of of big ones and why if you you the man you need to go back and do a study like what were the water conditions because if you look at four pounders probably eight years old something six eight years old so if the study was being done I, I would i would like to know what the lake levels were from like 2001 to 2003 to why those fish around 2010 were so big wow. so I don't, I don't know if they had just great spawns and and those fish but something's going on now with our lakes and if you look, the population is still in Douglas as far as bass goes, but the crappy population is wiped out too. And it happened both at the same time. So I'm not sure if, and we're missing the age class of bass in Douglas. There is no, like a, a steady number of four to six pounders anymore like there used to be. And there's not really many three and three quarter pounders in there like there used to be. So why are we missing the age class of, of that or above so i don't know if it's water level because we, what we deal with what you guys don't deal with we deal with 40 foot fluctuations each year it's a miracle of god that they actually are able to survive and spawn and 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 do what they do in our lakes and why douglas and douglas is one of the most fertile lakes in the state why because the rivers that run into it are so long out of north carolina and they did they did a study about the fertility of it and it's my favorite out of the two and that's probably why i'll speak on it more but I'm un I'm unsure of why the population of crappy has just decimated and how the 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 bigger class of largemouth has been decimated. Uh, do I have a know how that? No, I don't. I don't know if it's tournament pressure. I can't see tournament pressure being it so for so long. Something that caused them not to spawn good and reproduce good for a certain number of years. And I don't know if that's spring flooding where we had a lot of elevation coming up and down because. Douglas will come up 15 feet in three days where you guys don't, don't ever have to deal with something like that. I've seen it come up 30 feet, in a, you know, in less than a week. So I'm not sure if we had a lot of that in the spring that, that affected spawns over a long time, but it's not just bass. It's crappy too there. Cherokee is going through a change where that, that water over there in Douglas is too, where the water is getting so, so much clearer. I can remember fishing Cherokee and Cherokee and Douglas growing up would always have just a great color, almost like a, like a Rayburn color to it. You know, how it's got that just, just good cranking color is what I call it. But now those, those things get gin clear and you see the largemouth population on Cherokee really diminish where it was really good. And the smallmouth population was really good. But now it seems like both of them just aren't good. Even smallmouth Cherokee is not as good as it was. So I don't have a, a, um, rhyme or reason of why that is there's something going on around that that they're not getting a good hatch here's the only problem i've got with everything so i said i went to some of the twra guys and i said well won't we get won't we get a head start on this so so we don't have these big lulls in population of fish won't we just do a steady stock and where we don't have to stock a lot but stock to where we don't get these huge roller coaster drop-offs and huge roller coaster you know going like this that we can maybe level the playing field. They, this is the quote they told me. They say they don't, they stock don't stock. They don't stock for population. They say stocking doesn't help. Correct. And I can't argue this in a way because if you look, they have put hundreds of thousands of F ones in in Fort Loudon. They put a lot of F ones in Boone, and they put F ones in and and they they can't even shock one up like. There's, they, they're There's stocking no for genetics, not for population. And yeah. and, and cuz I I okay. I want so there's two things to that. Before we get into what I wanted to say. If they're not stocking for population, and I agree with them. They're not, okay? They're talking about 100,000 bass, right? I mean 100 dropping 100,000 bass in a is not a big deal for them, right? 
I'm just this is for all the other people out there that are like go crazy on 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 catching a fish on a bed. I just want to uh, catching a fish on a bed or keeping fish or any of this stuff. If they will drop, if they don't care about stocking a lake with a hundred thousand fish in it, because it's not going to help the population, then taking a hundred thousand fish out of there doesn't hurt the population either. I'm just telling you guys, and I've done this so much, and I'll go back into what everything Mullins was saying. Everything is based off freaking. To me, I don't even live on those lakes, but I've seen them. All you got to do is have a horrible spring, a horrible flooding situation. Because, guys, that doesn't happen in the real world. Flooding happens, okay? Flooding is not the problem, in my opinion. A lake coming up, if rain happened to any natural lake, it would come up and bass would survive. What's not normal is for that lake to freaking drop. Yeah. When you suck a lake out, nothing in nothing in, in naturally sucks the lake water out. So, like, a fish get up there and trying to spawn – and they laid all their eggs, and all of a sudden, that bed a day later is freaking three foot up on the bank. That's way worse because that doesn't happen naturally in lakes. So I think flooding in our lakes do come up and down. That's why Rayburn's so good. I said it came up five foot in two weeks. It'll take three to four. It'll take three to four weeks for it to drop five. So like a fish can lay its eggs, do its thing, you know. Th- five days later, they've hatched their fry and they move up and down with the water. Like we don't, that's why Rayburn stays so good. Toledo can have a problem because they will kind of like, they'll make it kind of go up a little bit faster and, but it's still not as, they don't suck Rayburn like they do Toledo. It's because it's, we're, because Toledo, they have to for, uh, they have to run water through Toledo. Rayburn, yeah. they don't because it's a, um, a flood control lake. What I'll say about this, and I've done tons of videos in the past on this. I don't need um, a biologist telling me about why a fish grows. No more. I had one. I'm, I'm sitting there looking at it. I had one in my tank. Okay. And I, I studied him for as long as I ever wanted to do. I know, I know why he eats and why he doesn't. And he does not eat because he's hungry. I've said this a million times. That fish does not eat because it's hungry. It eats because it's freaking healthy. They're not humans. People try to relate the two. We're not, we're not the same. We eat because of all the different kinds of things. If that thing is in great water and freaking like, and that's to me, that's the number one thing. I've seen it now. That's all I ever have to see anymore. If you have phenomenal water quality, that my fish in that tank would eat all day long, 24 hours a day, and would never stop eating. Like it would eat and then it would be so blowed out. And it have a tail sticking out, and it's like hunting something else. It's yeah. like going around the tank for hours until it finally di- digests that to where it can eat, like just get it down to where I can eat something else. Hmm. They, it, it, it's not, it's not like he got tired of eating. It's just if it was there, he would eat constantly. So you got if you have a, a, a new lake, right? And I'm gonna get into the new lake. If you got a new lake. It's freaking so fertile. And you were like, man, this lake's so good. Well, that's because every fish in there is like thriving. And it's just eating nonstop. And fish that would take, you said, eight years to grow four pounds. They're growing it in one and a half to two years. Because they, and especially down here where we don't, it's it's warm. You know, we don't get ice or anything. They, they just never stop eating. That's yeah. why Falcon and Amstead, when they were at their peaks, they got like that in, in, in less than five years, four years, they were like 10 pounders were probably four years old. Like they were, they were growing. It was, they, they were so low for that long that when they filled up, it was a brand new lake. It went from 20% full to 120% full. It was like, there's trees everywhere. It was a brand new lakes. What you said about all these lakes, and this is the problem. When we start, when we start figuring out when all these lakes were built, because I know all the lakes around our house, like Rayburn and Toledo, Livingston, all these lakes that we all fish. Well, we're all talking about 20 years ago. Well, they're 20 years older now and they're not going to be as good. Like they just, they're just not as fertile as they once were. And they're, I don't think, and they're not going to get any better. You know what I'm saying? 
Like they're yeah. now the fishing pressure, that's a different, that's a whole different deal. I think, I think the the pressure of live scope is going to make it harder to catch fish. And I only say that because um all those fish that are swimming out in the middle of the lake that don't get fished for basically don't see a lure for six months. And then when they finally do come to the bank and someone catches them or come to a spot, like they'll eat a crankbait. But now they've been out there, had a little Demiki rig in their in their face. And now they're probably not as apt to to bite something a month later when they get when they get where you would normally catch them. I, yeah, well, I think y'all saving thing. grace though. Y'all saving grace is your ability to have grass in those lakes. And you see that with Toledo, like it just yeah. you know, I fished Toledo three times. The first two tournaments I fished there, I was like, Man, this is such a great lake. The last time I fished there is when everything was sprayed and everything's dead. I was like, this is one of the worst lakes I've ever been to in my yeah. life. So that's that's y'all's differences. You know, we can't have grass because obviously there are fluctuations. Yeah. But you know, that's y'all's saving grace, and that's why y'all's population can boom back is just because of the grass, and hopefully they they uh, continue to not spray that. No, what's crazy? Well, the spraying wasn't that. The spraying didn't kill the grass. The floods killed the flood. The fluctuation of of uh, the water and the muddy. The we had we had two, if not three, at least two of the worst floods we've ever had in like 30, 40 years. Yeah. And so um, when you, when they ran water, like they did, I mean, I went down is unreal. They ran mud water through that lake and pulled on it so hard for, for so long. That's what initially killed the grass. So like that's where it took grass that was out there in 16, 17 foot out of the lake. And it would have eventually come back, but then that flood also brought out Salvania. Yeah. So then, then they started spraying the Salvania. Well, there was so much grass in the lake normally that even if they had sprayed the Salvania and killed some of the grass, so much of the other grass would have lived and it would have come back. But the flood killed it all, and so then you, you had a the flood killing it all, and then they were spraying at the same time, so like new grass couldn't grow, right? Mm-hmm. And so. It was just a bad ordeal. What I wanted to say about the the clear thing, did y'all y'all ever deal with zebra mussels? Yeah, we have. Uh, you know, I've never seen them myself, but I have heard they 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 were in some of our lakes. I'm not sure if they're still in our lakes, but you know, a lot of our deal has a lot of our deal is the less fertility in the water. And if you look at agricultural uh, up in our rivers, isn't there like it used to be? I mean, it used to be when I was growing up, like every field on the river had corn everywhere. So, you know, you had a lot of runoff from, from, uh, from mud sediment, you know, the, what everything wasn't grass. And I don't know if that's what caused a lot of it, but you don't, you, you don't see that color in the river like you used to when it was fertile and fishing real good. Like even the rivers are clear now and it, you know, fishing to me, the clearer usually is the, the worst. I like some color in the water because well, you so- that so that I bring that up because Texoma got zebra mussels uh, years back and it mm-hmm. cleared Texoma like crazy. Texoma was like, but not like guys were catching nines and tens. And like, we were like, we would go up there and fish tournaments. And if, and like we fish, yeah, everyone talks about Rayburn. They'd have the, like the TXTT. If you go look at the results from like six years ago or something like that, I, I don't remember exactly when it was, but, so uh what it happened for about four years you go fish texoma in a txt and look at the raven results and the and texoma and the te- the raven results would be like top 50 would be like 12 pounds and yeah. then texoma top 50 would be like upper 15s and mm-hmm. there'd be like 15 bags over 20. Now, now the winning weight might be different, but the overall fish catches on Texas, and it was like that in the zebra mussels. And despite everyone, you know, way invasive and all these things, every lake we knew of that got zebra mussels, Ray Roberts was one. When Ray Roberts was really, really good about the same time six years ago, it was clear and there was freaking, we were all catching big ones out of there, like really good mm-hmm. uh, zebra mussels. The zebra, we all said like, I mean, every lake that has zebra mussels, we're okay with because like they're way better now. And then all of a sudden, as the zebra mussels died off, the lakes kind of like went back to normal again or like are slowly going back there. But the zebra mussels cleared all the lakes up around here. 
Now, yeah. I don't – take someone who doesn't have grass, Ray Roberts that let the grass grow better because it made it clear. Yeah. That's funny how you say that the clear hurt y'all, and to us, the lakes that are clear are better. Well, again, y'all got grass. And see, that's the thing, so thing about a it. thing about a largemouth is, you know, that's what we were predominantly fishing for. You know, when we weighed in those big bags of Cherokee in the early 2000s, let's say in, in February, we would have four four-pound largemouth and one four-pound smallmouth. And that's the way it was. You'd, you'd catch one smallmouth probably weighing in. And then there were some people catch more than that. But, like, I'm thinking about all my bags, maybe have two smallmouth in it. Good watercolor. You know, the fish didn't have to go that deep. Um, and for largemouth, that's that's what you need in our lakes because our cover is so limited. You know, the only thing to keep them up there, you know, shallow for is, is that is that watercolor. So so now they get clear. So largemouth have to move a lot more. So I don't think they thrive as good when they have to constantly chase bait like a smallmouth as, as, and, and, and be more visual than uh, get them. And what they've got so i you know I, in, the, is, there, is there lakes where largemouth thrive yes in in, in clear water yeah absolutely but for the most part it seemed like our lakes fish so much better when they had color to it right they they yeah i don't know takes so much just seem it takes uh, yeah i'm just going off a couple of lakes that we kind of fish i you know um the one What's thing that i don't huh I was reading this. Does flooding current have an influence on the shell population? Is he talking about like, like mussel shells? Yeah. So the one thing, mussel shells are a giant, giant, giant deal, and it's probably the one thing of, of, I don't know much about. I, I know I'm, I know a little bit about, but I don't, I don't know a lot of people that really know a lot of things about them that actually relate to fishing. The only we all know it. We all know know was like Kentucky Lake or Pickwick. That's a, I mean, they used to hunt them. You know, they used to, to actually harvest shells there. You know, shells are constantly moving. But as far as, yeah, I'm sure a flood's going to move them around just like it would a pebble or a rock or anything. What, what are, they're hunting those shells. What's that? They hunt those shells. Are they um, diving for those? Are they hunting them? Not like that. So I we have them on Livingston. Um, I mean, I could go hunt thousands of, i mean well if the lake drops up uh, in the summertime like we were out there my kids love finding them i mean but i mean they can find hundreds a day and they're big giant like they're big ones yeah you know and um i don't know if that's the same shell that we find on rayburn at times because a lot of those shell the shells we see on rayburn and toledo when the water drops are like the little small ones like 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 those yeah and see like a lot of guys that were from the west part of the state would always come up to like Douglas and Cherokee, and you know they'd say, "Well, we we'll cut them off a shell bed. We don't have shell beds on Cherokee and Douglas. You know, there might be some shells around, but we don't have shell beds. We got." Well, I think ones. people just like saying shell bed. I don't think I don't think a lot of people know. But like on Kentucky, one hundred percent pick with one hundred percent. Like there's actual shell beds there that you catch fish off of. And again, those. Those things move not only with current, but they'll move just to move. You know, they can they can move around. So, well, uh, Timmy Horton was always uh, one that always talked about shell beds, and I've heard uh, uh, Chris Powell talk about shell beds on Kentucky Lake, and that's the only lake I can really think of off the top of my head where you know big shells were. And you go down to Florida, you, obviously you fish shell beds a lot down there, but I'm not sure the difference what the type is. But yeah, they they move around. Well the the what i'll say about that so the one, one thing i did and this is just what i read about it because it made sense so we had we had a we had a spot for a while and we won probably over a hundred thousand on it and the first time i didn't know it at first so i caught like a 10 pounder there and then my second fish i ever caught there was another 10 pounder this is on rayburn and then um it was one cast. It was literally one cast deal. And it was always in the, like closer to the winter time, you know? And so, and then I, I finally, I fished the tournament. We won. I won it. I was in, it was a team event, but I fished it by myself. I caught them all somewhere else, but I went, I went to it at the end of the day and catch like an eight pounder on the, on the same cast. I had like 28 pounds or something. And then it, but it was only like that one, 
like that one cast. And the next year, it got a little bit better. And then me and Russell won a tournament off of it. It was like 35. And uh, but it got bigger, like the area got bigger. And I remember like going, hey man, there's like four or five casts now that you can get bit. And you could feel it down there, little little spots of it and stuff. And it stayed like that for a while. Then the flood came, or we had some floods, whatever. And now that spot sucks. Never was the same again. Well, it, it catches fish, but not like that. And it's very, very like before it was like automatic. Mm-hmm. And then I read somewhere because I was like, I guess they moved. And from what I heard is most of those shell bait. Now, I don't know if this to be true, but it makes a lot of it sort of makes a lot of sense. Is that like they 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 like I can't remember if it's like eight to twelve or eight, six to eight or eight to ten. They like a, a certain water level. Like that's mm. where they like thrive the best. And so I and it made a lot of sense because when the water came up for a long time, right? Got, yeah, yeah. And now now where we were catching them. Um, and I'm not saying we could catch them in eight foot, but it seemed like it moved them. And then yeah. we found a spot one, we found a spot like a couple years ago, like three years ago, the water had been up high and it was like on top of this flat and it was like five foot. Now we didn't really catch, we caught some fish there, but it was like super hard, like super, like, like it was a shell bed. And I'm like, yeah, the water's been up. And now the water finally got back to normal and it was in like five foot. I'm like, I bet you if I went there now, I bet you they're not there. I bet you it's too shallow. Mm-hmm. But I remember the funny shield bed story I've got is I was like that that top top ten I had at Harris chain. Like I'm fishing through the grass and throwing your lure, and uh, I'm just firing around. I, I'm just not not even really looking where I'm throwing. I'm just throwing, you know. I throw over here and I catch me a three pounder. I take it off the hook. I throw it right back in the same spot. And this is like the last day of practice. I throw it through there. I'm winding it through there, and I catch two three pounders. I got one on the front, one on the back. And I'm like, huh, what is that? So I, I, I shine my I shine my panoptics over there because in shallow water, panoptics is really good. Obviously, you've seen Scott Martin went out the uh, Okeechobee deal. And I shine over there, and, you know, I'm on a grass flat, and it's, there's a shell bed cut cut out in this grass flat. And it's perfectly circled, and you can see all the beds. You know, it looks like bluegill beds with shell beds. And, like, I shine it through there, and I, I, I see all these little white dots swimming through it. And they were all bass. And I'm like, starting right here late little did i know there was like 150 people going to start in the same area you know but luckily nobody had found that particular shell bed like people were just fishing the grass didn't know exactly what was there and i remember dude i pull up i stopped short of it there's people shutting down you know 100 yards there 50 yards over there nobody's trying to get where i'm at and i shut down stop short up and fish my way up to it and like when i finally see it on panoptics i just power pull down i and I could see like 30 dots swimming through there. And dude, I start just railing them. I'm catching them every throw. And I remember Rick Clum was like on the right side of me. And he's coming around and he's caught like one. And he's watched me catch 20, you know. And he fishes behind me and he's fishing around. He comes back around like 10 minutes later. I'm still catching them every throw. And because I mean, I'm like, I got to burn it. There's so many people in here. As soon as I leave, right. someone's going to come over here, you know. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to do Rick a solid right here. Like, hey, Rick. He said, yeah. He said, you want you some of this? And he, he looked, he's kind of smiled. He said, nah, you go ahead. You're doing good. And I was like, I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, you know, if I come over and start catching with you, he said, everybody else is going to think it's cool to just come over there and catch them with you too. So he said, you go ahead. So I was like, man, that's awesome. I just offered Rick, Rick a hole. We probably wouldn't have done that for anybody else, but since it was clogged in my hole, he wouldn't even take it. And he still caught 20 pounds that day. <laughs> but I remember after after he kind of scattered out of there, I caught like two more. And it was my two biggest ones of the day. And uh, I ended up leaving there. But I started there every morning. And uh, But after, after it was all said and done, like I could shine that panopsy over there and I could only see like one left, you know. But they yeah. reloaded. For some reason, they reloaded on that on that one particular shell bed every morning. I could go over there and catch a limit real quick. And the second day, I popped over there and I caught like a two pounder. And the second throw, I caught a five. You know, so that's cool to have a uh, spot to start on like that. But that's that's my Rip Klein story. Is he was he was gracious enough not even to come over there and smart enough that he he went and caught twenty pounds somewhere else and still in the top ten. I I don't. I this is a semi shell shell bed story. 
I think. Uh, so you be the judge. So me and Brent were fishing this tournament up, up on Rayburn. And it was in like uh, like mid-June. It wasn't a big tournament. And we tra- we got to trailer. The lake had been super low. So it was it was probably 10 years ago. Probably like two thir- 2013 or 14. The lake had, had come back up. Um, and so when the lake was low, it all the grass grew up north. Which we hadn't seen grass grow uh, up north. I'd never seen grass grow up north in my life. Right? It, it had grown up there. 10 years before I got there. And then it's just like the river. It was always the river up there. So grass grew up there and it was like the most phenomenal frogging ever. Right. It was like crazy, but we're in this one, one Creek and we're fishing around and there's like, it's matted grass and it's only four foot tall. You know, it's not like Raven. It's different, right? It's up the river. It's, it's, it's not even that far up the river, but it's just North. And, uh, and so we're up there and like, we're looking at all this grass in this one creek where we catch them without grass. And we're like, okay, we're going to smash on them. And we fished for like an hour and a half. And we hadn't had a, maybe it had like one little 13 incher. And the grass is all matted and we're fishing where the channel, the creek channel kind of runs through there. And we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. We finally come across and the grass wasn't, it was matted. And all of a sudden, like there was a little part that was like, you wouldn't notice it until you got right on it. Mm. You know, that's kind of got like a little hole, kind of like it's a little stringy there. And I throw my frog, nothing. And he throws a swim jig over there and like four pounder, like gets it. He's like, Hey, I, I got one. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I saw it. I saw it. That's cool. I'm like, shake it off. So like, you know, we go through and uh, we fit, never get another bite for like another hour. So we kind of come back through and we're looking at that thing and I throw, throw a swim jig over it, nothing. We throw a frog over nothing, nothing. And I'm like, huh? And and like, remember, it's shallow, right? I mean, yeah. so he just picks up old, old, big, nasty, old, big worm. He just throws a little big worm in there. And, you know, I, whatever, dude, if there was a bunch of fish there, he throws in there. He's like, got one. I mean, it, I mean, it hit bottom. He's like, hey, got one. And I'm like, nah. He's like, yeah. So he reels in, you know, shakes it off, throws back out there, got another one. And I was like, whatever. <laughs> And I hadn't even like I'm like digging around now. He's shaking them off. He throws back in there. He's like, got another one. I'm like, dude, set the hook on it. Cause you know, these are probably like little ones. He sets the hook, it's like a three and a half, four pounder. And I'm like, oh man. You know, so we're looking around. We haven't seen a boat all day, but it's Rayburn, you know, kind of like you said, like you found this spot. You didn't know everyone was gonna start there. Yeah. So we're looking around, going, okay, tournament starts tomorrow. And then we find out it was a trailer event. And uh Nick, all I know is, is like, we got to start here. And then they let us go at like five o'clock in the morning. And I remember starting and for some reason, my graphs weren't working and then I had no GPS. So Brent, it's, it's pitch dark outside. And if you've ever <laughs> driven on Rayburn nor, and it's kind of low, it's in June. So it's not high. We drove like nine miles down boat lanes in the dark, pitch black. Brent's on his phone looking at a, like his phone as a GPS and I'm looking at his phone driving and there's stumps everywhere. Like I don't know. Oh. How, we make it there. We're so excited because we have to idle pretty good ways to get to it. Once we, once we get close enough and I look out there and I'm like, I don't see any lights, David. We didn't see, there wasn't a person within five miles of us, but yet we had to get it. So we started there and at, if we started at seven o'clock at seven twelve, at seven twelve easily, probably about about seven oh eight. But at seven twelve, we were taking pictures, sending them to our buddy, like goofing off with them that wasn't in the tournament. We're like, we're like, told you it was gonna be a good day. Cause I mean, we're like, there's boat, there's fish flopping around, we're culling. It was it was every cast for like 45 minutes. On a little small shell spot. Right. So I didn't think much about it, right? Well, that you know. Now I go out there and the grass finally died and I had a waypoint there, right? No big deal. But every year, you know, I, I get rid of waypoints and I, you know, I transfer them over and all this stuff. Well, a couple of years later, I couldn't find that waypoint. And I thought I knew kind of where it was at. You know, I, I know where it's at, but I can't find it. And one day I got to talking to Phil Marks about telling him this story. And yeah. Phil was like, I know where that's at. I'm like, whatever. 
And he's like, I know, I know the exact spot. He said, and he told, he told this like similar story without grass. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I caught him there cranking every single cast. And I'm like, dude, I, man, there, that, that area is so big. There's no way, you know, how do we even know we're talking about the same spot? Cause I can't even find it again. I just mm -hmm. know it's somewhere on the edge of this Creek. And he, cause it's not like on a bend or anything. It's just right there. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, man. Um, the lake got low like 10 years earlier before then he said it wasn't grass, but like, you know how just random stuff grows when the lake gets slow. It might be a, a certain type of weed or a certain type of like stick. You mm -hmm. know, there's, he said the, that whole thing was all sticked up, like cine bean tree sticks. He said, all of a sudden, and you look out there and there's this one little spot where sticks didn't grow. And he said, man, I just, I freaking saw it, you know, and I, and I waypointed it. And he's like, I wonder why that stuff's not growing there. And he said, he went back there when the, when all that stuff died and cranked him off that spot. I huh. still don't have the waypoint. I still don't have it to this day. Yeah, I've tried looking for that thing, and I can. I probably come close to it, and I probably fished over it. But it, it's I, I. I thought they were there, and I do believe that they were there because it was a perch bed. But I think the perch bed was created because it's a hard spot shell bed type deal. Probably is nothing growing there. It's probably Nothing's a hard spot. growing there, and I think the perch yeah. spawn there. But probably. but I guarantee you, it's still a spot, and I. And yeah. to this day, can't find it. Huh? Can't find it. I can get within probably like 50 yards of it. I just don't know if it's, you know, like you also have to hit it at the right time, right? Like it has to be right. You have to yeah. hit it at a certain, I'm sure you have to hit it at certain times of the year and it's, it's the right, but yeah, pisses me off. Just if they ever get on it, you won't, you'll know when you get near it. It sounds like that's what I'm hoping, but man. I can. I'm usually pretty good about memory stuff. But I. I don't know. I don't know where it's at. That's, I mean, I don't know. You know. That's the funny thing about Cherokee is like, Cherokee's not known as a good structure lake per se, like like Douglas is. But the biggest schools I've ever found in my life's been on Cherokee. But the thing about Cherokee is, like, they might not use us. Like, you go to these lakes, and some lakes they'll go to the same spot every year, like post pond. Do Cherokee. You might catch them off a spot, and you might catch 150 off one spot and sit there and make the same cast over and over and over and over and over and catch them. They might not ever go back to that spot again, or they might not show back up on it for 10 years. That's that's the thing about Cherokee is kind of like what you're talking about. It's like I've caught – there's so many places on Cherokee that I've caught bass that this, they don't they don't use very often, and I don't know what the <laughs> rhyme or reason is for that. And a lot of our deal is, you know, the lake is never the same when – at each year so it might be 10 foot higher one year 10 foot lower but you know after so many years of fishing now, i've got places where i've like i've wrote down you know what what level the lake was at a certain time but they might use a spot like once every 10 years or never again well rayburn rayburn is that for us everyone so and if and people don't believe me but so i was talking about transferring all them waypoints uh so when i switched to garmin this past year you have garmin right yes um did you switch there so there's a way to switch from whatever there is to garmin correct uh i don't know of it if if there is i'm, I'm i've been garmin so long now i, I haven't you had to you know okay bring, well, well there, there's a way to do it i don't know i'm asking because i don't know that way i don't i did not so for all the years I've been fishing, and I still have them all saved on chips. Mm -hmm. But so I've been with Garmin for, or I've had a Garmin units on there for a year. Not one waypoint has ever been transferred over. Yeah. And I, I don't think you can take a waypoint from, you know, you can enter it in manually, but I don't think you can take a card from another unit. Put it in well, no, I think so from what I was told that you can take a card and I think you might even have to send it off to Garmin or something and they can do it. There's a way to do it. But I'm just telling you, if no one believes me that I don't care about waypoints on Rayburn, that should tell you. I do, like if you want waypoints on Rayburn, I don't have them for you. Yeah. Good luck because I, like they, they don't mean anything to me anymore. They just yeah. because of the same deal. People think you it's all these waypoints, and um, and I, I like they they change so much. I would love for that to stay the same, but I just you know and see like 
you know, I, I knew once we started talking about that, that there's a lot smarter people than us. Yeah. And, and, and there's a way to do it. Right. I'm just telling you, I haven't done it. If. Frank, I, Frank said there's a program. To, huh? Frank said there's a program you can download where you have to change the file over from. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I remember Zach Brown telling me from Garmin that he's like, you could send them in to me and I could do it for you. And I'm like, all right. And I just never did. Yeah. And then. I get to going out there and you know, they're just, they're just memories. Those waypoints are just memories for me on Rayburn because most of them like, and they might be good for a couple more years. And then I just know they're not going to be yeah. there's, I have, I, I would, I'd have to think real hard, man. I just don't think I have hardly any that are going to be other than like a community hole. Like that's a, like a road or a brick. I mean, that's, I'm talking about like a spot that like, you throw on and catch fish like mm -hmm. that no one knows about those type yeah. deals. I don't have any of those. I have some from this year that I found, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I know what's going to happen in three years or a year, or six months from now, they're going to be worthless. Right. Yeah. It seems like waypoints is definitely uh way it, it's going away with, well, like, you know, with live scope and everything else. You see kids that yeah. don't have any fishing experience at all that have no, you know, instinct about it that all they do is live scoop now and catch them and it's just like don't even need waypoints you just put the scroll motor down and you find one well rob rob newell so i was i listened to a little bit today and rob rob newell made the comment rob's you know who used to commentate for bpt which i find it odd that i was like so you're still you're still doing invitationals uh i tasted him that this one he hadn't texted me back but he was mate drew gill was fishing and drew at the time was leading. I don't think he's leading anymore. He might be in like third or something, but, and he was the guy that I was like, man, he's probably closer. He was doing some stuff that I, not everything, but I saw, I kind of saw what he was doing, but he was talking about the fact of like how he can gain knowledge now with live scope, where it took us 20 years to kind of do that. Mm -hmm. it's probably and, true. and it's, he, cause he's, he, you're studying the fish to a degree. Now, what I would say is, is I get a lot of questions about live scope and stuff. And I'm like, Hey, look, man, live scope fish and regular fish, are, in my opinion, are kind of two different things or can be two different things. And so he's learned a lot about live scope fish, but I don't think there's no way he understands. And a lot of these guys, you, you have to know the other part. Like there's things that the other fish do that, you really can't study on live scope. It's hard to explain, but you know, it's just a different type of deal. Like it's hard to like Nick LeBron's in second, I think. Good luck trying to live scope throwing a trap in the grass. Right. You, I mean, I'm not saying you can't catch one, but I promise you that's not what he's doing to catch fish in the grass like that. Right. It's just, it's just a and and I'm sure Drew Gill will be the first one to tell you because I've talked to him. I mean, he's like, man, I don't, I don't think, I think what he told me, I saw him at the, at Lake of the Ozarks. I think he's like, man, I hadn't caught a fish off that wasn't, I wasn't looking at in like two years. Yeah. And I can see that. I mean, like, it's just mind boggling that the shallow tournaments now that are one on, especially bed fishing tournaments are one on live scope. But. Well, I think that's going to be rare. I don't know. I think it's going to be, I think when I say it's going to be rare, I don't. So here's what I mean by rare. And when you look at, if you, did you watch any of the BPT on Toledo? Very little. Okay. But you, if, did you watch five minutes of it? Yeah. I probably watched five minutes of it. Was yeah. everyone doing the same thing? Yeah. That's what I mean by rare. So Scott might win the event doing it. Scott might've been one of three people doing it. And that's probably why I didn't watch much of it because, you know, they show five people, five people live scope in open water. Okay. I've seen all I need to see. So, so I did a live, I did a, I did one of these live at the same amount of time. And I said the same thing. I looked at it. I watched 10, maybe 10 minutes of it at most. Mm -hmm. Once I saw the same amount of people doing all the same thing that I knew was, and I'm like, yeah, okay, well, you're about to watch four out. You're about to watch three days of this of the same of the same thing of basically a guy crappie fishing and i'm like yeah i don't need to watch this anymore you know if if they had a bunch of ot defoes and 
different guys up there buzz baiting and doing this, doing that, it would have been I'd have watched it because I would have like watched seen other guys doing different things. But yeah, so like, yeah, I flipped it on. I flipped it on there today, and it was a uh, uh, the little short guy, um, Dakota. Everybody. Dakota, Dakota Ebert. He showed him, and he caught one on a 6XD, a chartreuse blue 6XD, and I'm like, thank God somebody can still catch one cranking. Oh, you can still catch one cranking. Yeah. So it was uh, it was him. And then I seen, uh, you know, Nick was catching a few on a trap and a chatterbait, and I'm like, I like this, you know. And then Maybe it was drop can... shot, drop shot, drop shot. Drop, drop, drop shot to Mickey. Yeah, the rest of it. And 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 I could have told you that, like, that I think most of those guys doing that, are going to catch if they don't catch a decent one are going to catch 12 13 12 pounds a day maybe 13 if they catch a diff, decent one they'll have 16 or 17. now i'm not mm-hmm. saying the guy won't catch 23 but it's it's one of those deals where i always so i always used to get an argument with holman it's kind of like my comment to you about it's still going to be rare that someone might win a tournament doing it but it's going to be rare that that's the pattern right and so when we used to Hallman used to come down here all the time and man, the water would be up and he'd start flipping them bushes. And I'm like, good luck. <laughs> and next thing I know, you know, it, we'd, we'd get into it. And every year he'd come down here and every year I'm like, I'm not flipping bushes. It's not the way to win. It's not the way to win. It never is. Yeah. And then every year in the top 10, there'd be like, seven guys or eight guys in the top 10 all flipping bushes he's like look todd look and i'm like i get it they ain't winning right they're the top t- but they're not winning and, right. he, and, and it, he's like yeah but todd you know this and that and i'm like man that that guy that flipped bushes came in third place and he was nine pounds out of out of first and i said what was the guy doing in first i think he's carolina rigging I'm like there you go i said yeah. here's the difference holman there was 180 guys in this event, 150 of them flip bushes. So yes, yeah. most of them are going to be in the top 10. There was 10 guys, Carolina rigging, and three of them made the top 10. Right. And one of them is going to win it. I said, if you put all those guys flipping bushes and all made them go for three days, go Carolina rig, right? Now, a lot of them would have zeroed and done bad, but I said the entire top 10 would have been Carolina riggers. And yeah. I was like, it was easier to make a top 10 flipping, but it, was, it wasn't it was the way to win. And I think that's what's like, it's very easy right now to Rayburn to go out there and to Mickey Fish and catch 11 pounds scoping. Yeah. But you're probably, I'm not saying it won't be one doing that, but I'm saying there's going to be a lot of guys that miss a check because they went and did that. Same thing with the grass. You can, like the grass fishing too, I think if you put most of those guys in the grass, you got, I think, a way better chance of catching 16 pounds if they kind of know how to fish grass. Now, a lot of them guys don't know how to fish grass. Yeah. How do you think Rayburn's going to be one? Uh, offshore. Do you think it's going to be a Carolina rig to a drop shot no. or you going to be scoping? No, I don't think um, – Semi scoping, semi scope, semi scoping. Yeah, like, I mean, so I've caught a couple of big ones out there, and a lot of them weren't scoping. But uh, the problem is, is like, there's a couple guys in there that are like locals. Listen, you have a big tournament with with 200 of us locals. There's still only like five or six of us that that find a spot that that's worth like that can win a tournament off of, mm-hmm. right? So. 99% of those guys won't find those spots. They're, they're, you're, you don't find them in a day or two. Right. So it's definitely becoming a pattern. Um, guys like Dickie Newberry, Dakota Eber- Well, Dickie's probably not doing it, but Dakota, um, Marshall Hughes. There's a couple guys that like can find one of those deals. If they find one of those deals, and I'm not saying they'll win a tournament off, but they catch a, they can start there in the morning and catch a big one. And mm-hmm. then they can go catch 16 pounds live scoping. I 22 pounds a day times three, good chance they win it that way. Yeah. They missed the first morning. Now, if the wind blows, it might be a little bit harder to fish those spots and scope at the same time. Why do you think those fish bite in Texas first thing in the morning on some of those spots? Um, we've, gone o- 
we've gone over this a bunch. We've talked about me and Russell have talked about it a bunch. And um, and they bite in the grass the same way. But yeah, why why is it the first thing in the morning there? Like there's not like other places in the country, like maybe when the sun gets out or maybe yeah. midday. But like it seems to be like if you go to Rayburn, you better be on your best stuff when the sunlight is cresting, you know, when you can barely see and like and, they're they're biting. And what's crazy is the top water bite is not good the top water bites like you like like how you say to be there when the sun's rising yeah well, sometimes that top water bite you can't catch them until like 30 minutes after the sunrise comes up but it's still pretty good in the morning when and i remember was, randy haynes told me that i remember randy haynes said man i don't know much about it but he said listen if you ever go to texas you better be on your juice first thing in the morning well I, 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 I will say this um I could probably tell you now if I if I if I go out there. And what I mean by that is if I go out there now, I could probably maybe if I find one of those spots, those spots aren't easy to find. And, and you can't just find like a, a a regular spot, but I probably need to go out there an hour to an hour and a half in the dark and go scope around out there and, and see if I can see them. Because Russell's kind of always thought that maybe that they were leftovers from the night before from the night so like they were feeding at night right and then all of a sudden the daylight comes and before they've left like you kind of get on them and and then as daylight comes they move off so like yeah. they get up there at night and then you catch the like when i say leftovers like you know they've been there for five hours and you're catching them on their way leaving yeah that they, they, they don't like push up because it's morning time that they're actually leaving and you're catching them as they leave He's you know, thought that. No, we don't know. That's just one of his thoughts. You know, funny funny thing about Douglas and Cherokee is, and I'm sure it's rest of them's like this uh, up our way. The places that are good in the daytime are rarely ever good at nighttime. The places I've sit there and caught a hundred and some in the daytime, you won't get a bite there at night. Okay, so so, so I'm not uh, sure why that is, but that that's the way it is here. I well, so I've heard that about Table Rock. I've heard that. Um, we, because everyone's like, do you ever night fish? I'm like, never. Like we, like we don't ever go out and fish at night because it, like, it's good during the day. Yeah, I will say that the the um, like at Conroe, you go there at, at night. They have like those evening tournaments, mm -hmm. or they have like where you can start early. Like, oh, you better be starting on the light. On a and it's freaking on. You find the right one, yeah. you catch like 26 pounds there in like 30 minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah. But then as soon as that light comes up, you know, it's light and they don't need that light, they're gone. And you'll never catch one there again. And I get it's a light thing, but there's something different with that night stuff and daytime stuff, but I don't know it. There is. They rarely ever use the same places at night in the daytime here. Very yeah. Rare. Very rare. And we saw, it, like you see it with brush piles too. We see it with that lake though. There's a lot of times that, yeah, daytime stuff and, so I will say this. You talk about the lull. There's someone talking about a lull. There is a 9 to 11 o'clock lull on Rayburn. That's like it lasts year round. Mm -hmm. 9 to 11, 8.30 to like 11.30, something like that. And there's a, it, it, I'm not saying you can't catch fish there. So I mean, there is a lull and it has been there since day one. And I don't care if it's wintertime, summertime, whatever. Mm. And then like 12 or 1 o'clock. Start a lot of times you can, you know, now it, now there's an evening time bite on Rayburn at times. That's like insane. Right. But not all the time. Like you can go out there some evening and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And then other times it's like when it, then like the whole place lights up for the, like the last two hours of the day. Mm hmm. You'll hear about guys catching them at the end of the day, and they'll, and they'll even be like, "Man, it got so good. I think it's an evening bite." And I'm just sitting here going, "You know, because they're not from here." And they're right. like, "I got really good," and I'm like, "They're like, but it got so good, it was so overwhelming to them. They're like, I think it has to be an evening deal." I'm like, "Yeah, it was. Don't count on that to happen during the event." Yeah, it turned out they're like, "Didn't happen." I'm like, "Yeah, I know." Yeah, and you know that's me and Ott's talk about. You know, Ott don't practice. He don't really practice past five o'clock in any of those tournaments. Four or five o'clock is when he gets off the water, and he always thought 
you know, his, I've, I've talked to him about this. It's been a while. His thinking process was a lot, a lot of times you find them in the evening, they're not going to be there. There's been a many a school I've found, you know, in our lakes, you know, you'd be idling around. I find them, you know, an hour before dark or something and, you know, end up going back and catching them the next day or during the tournament. Yeah. So there's definitely, there's definitely fish that, that they're not just evening times. I think that in my opinion on it, and it's, he's a lot better fisherman than I am, but my opinion on it is the more time you can put on the water, the better. But Well, I, I'm with you on that. He, he gets off the water at 4 or 5 o'clock and it works for him, so it's whatever works for you. Well, I, I'm with you on the fact that that if you're – I totally agree with him, and I do think like finding them, finding them bet- during your tournament hours is great, right? Mm. But, man, yeah, we found some fi- – so I'll tell you one, uh, Ray Roberts last year. I'm not saying we found the fish, but I found the – see, it might have been a pattern deal that we fished all day long, and, like, Russell was getting off the water because we had we had not – we hadn't had a bite in, like, 11 hours, either one of us. <laughs> we had caught, like, a couple in the morning, and then nothing. We had found some sight fish. And then – I was going, dude, yeah, that's all we have are those fish. We have nothing else. Like, I don't even know what we're supposed to go do the rest of the day. And at the very end of the day, I ran somewhere, and I'm like, I'm sitting in the boat, you know, like, not even fishing. And I'm like, gosh, should I just do this? Should I just, should I be really this guy? Like, you know, and I'm not saying I had to throw a, uh, my little spinning pole out there. But I basically did something that is, I really slowed down. Slowed yeah. down for me. And it was so bad, and I'm so and I'm not horrible at it. It's just I was not set up for it. Then my first cast, I backlash because I don't throw things this light. <laughs> right. I'm a, I'm done doing the backlash, you know, in freaking five to ten minutes, and I finally get it done. I'm like, oh, I got one, like a three and a half pounder. And then like three casts later, I catch a four pounder. I call it Russell. I'm like, Russell, he's already loaded his boat, like he's done. I said, Hey man, I think I figured something out. And he's like, Well, I'm gonna go get us signed in and everything, just keep going. Right. And I call an hour later, it's on. You know, it's by. I have to get off the water. I'm like, I've had four more bites, dude. We we got it. And sure enough, we went and caught our sight fish and did that the rest of the day and caught like twenty doing it. Yeah, whacked them. Yeah. yeah, we came in second. We almost won the the a boat. That was last year on Ray Roberts. But yeah, I mean, if I had gone in early, I didn't really find the fit. You know, I just figured out maybe how to catch them, but mm-hmm. yeah. the extra hour or so helped. Oh, he wants to know. Let's see. Cody Higgins. Ask Mullins if he'd been on Cherokee lately, and if so, how'd he do? Uh, buddy, I I don't fish. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't fish hardly at all at home anymore. And if I'm going to go, I'm definitely not going to go to Cherokee or Douglas. I'm probably going to go to Watauga or South Houston. It's just – it goes back to that. Like I said, it's just – it's not the same. The fishing is not as good. Um. You know, it's just not as fun to me to, to go to these lakes anymore like Cherokee and Douglas. I love them, but I, I just don't I don't go just because it's you got to go work, you know. And there'll, so, be, there'll be a time here next couple of weeks, especially if it stays warm, that it's going to be, you know, it'll get good like places do in the springtime, but consistently it's not. So, I know I haven't been to Cherokee, and from my knowledge, it's not, not fishing the best. So, when we went there for the tour, remember when we went there? Yeah. And – um practice was like practice was you know 30, 30 40 a day yeah it le- and that's like le- laying off of them yeah and then and then it, the the bite changed and they all went to the bank and then it was still 30 40 a day like it was just stupid on the bank like mm-hmm. even crazier and then the only other time i went was for a open in the fall okay and and for fall you know like whatever but there were some days out there i'd catch like there were decent days i had yeah know, maybe 10 or 12 but you know like you're not trying to catch fish you're just trying to like figure out what's going on so like yeah you get bit throughout the day don't know what you could have done if you ran the same pattern yeah um i zero day one because it changed and then day two i freaking i had one of the bigger bags right um maybe i didn't zero i don't know what i did day one but anyways um it wasn't like, I guess maybe that wouldn't be fun to go out there and do that just for fun fishing. Is yeah, it, is it, 
Has it gotten worse than that? Than yeah, it's okay. because that was probably nineteen. I think when you came up there and fished that open, nineteen or twenty, and it's uh, it's definitely definitely downhill since then. You know? Well, it was way, but it was the fall when we were there, so I can't say it was. You yeah, know. I mean, falls falls not very. I don't think there's any good fall fishing anymore anywhere. I, I, you know, it's, you, we grew up with man. I can't wait to the good fall fishing, but I haven't experienced good fall fishing in so many years. I couldn't tell you. So I'm not sure fall now is like, you know, fall used to start in October, but now I don't think fall starts here until like late December. And, it, you know, and then we don't have much of a winter anymore. So it's just. Can, can I, I'm a, can I tell my story about Cherokee? Go ahead. Yeah. So, so I'm out there for that open and, uh, and I, I talked to you cause you, people still don't realize like the way we might talk about something is like, I already knew what I was going to go do. So I was telling Mullins, I'm like, Hey, I got this swim bait thing. And, um, cause I, I ran the top water bite for like, I, like, so Christy ran the same top water bite as me that yeah. year, and he caught one fish. Right. Right. And I was like, I'm doing it. And in practice, I'm like, man, I can catch a big one or two, you know, or a three pounder here. And, and I'm like, God, I might have to cover, you know, nine miles of water in between bites. And I was like, but may, maybe it'll happen. And then I got on like a swim bait bite that that's what I do to catch smallmouth everywhere I go. So I got on that and then I got out there deep and I, I kind of got around some places and, and I'll never forget. I called you up and I'm like, man, I was just kind of telling you about my day. Yeah. Cause we weren't allowed, you know, we, we don't, I, I don't know. Maybe you could get in. I don't know. I was telling you about my day. And I'm like, yeah, I got on this and I got on that. And you're listening. And I said, man, but there's this one guy out here. I was like, I found some fish, man, out here deep. And this guy pulled up pretty darn, not close to me, but kind of. And he didn't bother me. And I was like, but shoot, I, I shook two off there. And he's over there kind of like 75 yards away. And he catches like two pretty good ones. And I'm sitting there going, this idiot over here. This guy's gonna like he's ruining it, you know. Well, like, he second. Yeah, he, and Mullins is like, and I kind of tell him who like. I say, what boat was it? You're yeah. like, he's a black, he's a skeeter, blah blah. I said, he'll catch him. Yeah, and I'm like, no, he, I'm like, whatever. Yeah, he finished second in the event. He led it for two days. That was Josh yeah. Wood was who it was. This guy yeah. with a little bit of the house. But man, like for a guy like me, I come down there and I'm shaking every single fish off, right? But yeah. I mean, that guy, he there's certain guys, and he was. He was like the exception to the rule that he probably was getting so many bites. He was just saying what the size of them yeah, were. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, totally different. I'm trying to get a bite. He's trying to look at the size of them. Yeah. But I was like, this guy, this guy's out here. And I drove by that. Once I knew it was him, and and this is the way I look at things. I had every right to go fish that, like that spot. Right. But I had my own patterns going, right? Because I was there before him. Now, it wasn't a waypoint. It was just this area. And uh, it, there was, it's these like two underwater islands and like 30 something foot. I hadn't really been, that was not my pattern, but I had found, I'd got bit out there. And, and so after day one, and I wouldn't ever really plan on going there. It was just a, maybe another option somewhere down the line. And so I went and did my deal and I drove by there after day one, I realized he was doing good. And I, there was no way I could ever pull up on that. I had every right to go there, but I was like, it's not like he, I don't even know if he caught any fish there. But yeah, I'm like, I'm just not going to go over there. Mom, day one, you got no business being there anyway. No, I would No, I never went and did it. Yeah. And I don't know if he ever fished that area. I'm sure he did, but I just couldn't even. I was like, yeah, I know, I know that guy caught him, and there's a possibility he caught him there. It, that's kind of that information of. It wasn't information from you. It was information of. I saw that guy there. I I caught him there too. Now he's in second. I don't know if he caught him there, but he could have. And so, yeah. or first, I'm like, I'm definitely not going there. Right. But I was like, yeah, who's this idiot out here catching fish? I was like, he's going to catch him. He's like, no, he's not, dude. He's out here sticking everything. He said, listen, that's Josh Rourke. He's going to catch him. And that's when, you know, there was a lot of smallmouth in that lake at that yeah. time. And since then, I mean, man, Josh talked about it. Uh, you know, he struggled to catch him down there because it just, they don't do the same thing that they did. Well, I, I know on day two, so I was catching them all shallow. And on day two, I got out there because um, after the event, you're like, what'd you do? And I'm like, well, 
freaking day two, I got out there and I wasn't catching very many and um or none. And I said, I got out there way deeper, where like further down the lake. And I said, man, I just kind of backed off on this one area. I don't know. And next thing I know, I catch this freaking big one out in like 22 on my swim bait. Yeah. And luckily, like five minutes later, I catch another one. And I was just going, I should do this all day. And I did it. And I caught four big ones. And then um there was a there was a real close by there's this rock that I found because I was in a barred boat that had live scope. So I, I knew very little about live scope. I remember there, was this, yeah. there was one rock I found and I, and I caught a fish on it on a drop shot in practice. And I ran over there and I ran a bunch of stuff like that. But on that same rock, I looked down there. And I'm like, I think that I didn't really know what I was looking at, but I was like, yeah. I think I see the rock and I'm like shaking my drop shot. And I'm like, I didn't, it's not like I saw the fish go over there, but I'm like, I'm on the rock. Don't. And I catch my fifth one of the day. Yeah. But I was like, oh, that's the power of live scope. Like it, it caught me one extra fish a day is what mm -hmm. I was thinking it was good for. Yeah. Now, now you just, you catch everything looking at it. Now you just catch everything. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I, well, I mean, we talked about this earlier. The pressure is what's going to make it harder to catch, but I don't think it's like, I think there's two things going on. I think lakes aren't as good at, anymore. There's not the fish population as there once was, but I definitely think that they're um, they're just harder to catch. Yeah, let's see. Does he think increased pressure was the problem downfall of these local lakes to Knoxville? And I'm not sure as far as Knoxville goes. I remember, you know, Loudon used to be a really good fishery, and it always took mid twenties to win there back when I was growing up. And now it's just terrible, man. I hate fishing there. And like the classic I bombed, you know, I spent every piece of my being trying to be over away from everybody, trying to catch them deep in Teleco. And I didn't I didn't fish the area where Gussie was fishing, but just because, you know, he won it the year before, you know, similar area. So I was like, I'm going to go way up Teleco. And I spent, I was either going to zero that tournament or catch him really good. And I didn't catch him at all. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure why. Loudon and Watts Bar and those lakes are just in the same way as Cherokee and Douglas. I don't know if it's pressure, and I don't think it's pressure on Loudon because Loudon hasn't been good in so long. But I, I can't really tell you why. I don't know if it's a fertility thing. Loudon's a lot more stable. I I can't. I don't know the rhyme or reason. I wish I had the answer because I would fix it for everybody and we'd all catch a lot more bass. <laughs> but it just it's they're definitely not as good as they used to be. See, something's going I looked at Rayburn. And see, I don't know if, if Rayburn is is um so I'm not watching this, so I can't see what's really going down. So I mean at a at 107th place to a, however many people there are, there's zeros. And I doubt they're zeroing. So so I don't know if you're, uh, you're, everyone has to turn in their weights, but some guys are. Uh, what are you talking about on, on Raven? Yeah, but some guys are starting to like pop up. Like now there's. Yeah, they'll probably just. Like I, mean, I don't I was, remember Mitchell Robinson and Nick Hatfield having, being anywhere close and now they have 20 pounds. So maybe their weights just got updated. There's five, no, no, one, two, three, five guys over 20. Um yeah they're starting to catch them i mean they still got they still got at least another hour a lot of them but i i just wonder if that's live scope or grass since i'm not watching because there's some other guys i know fishing grass i can assure you if, it, if nick caught them it's live scoping robinson t uh well is that is mitchell robinson that's marty uh, it's marty's son i believe well he's live scoping right i would think so yeah yeah so those are some live scopers that are catching them throughout the day. Let's see. Yeah, Nick, second, 22. And then Randy Colson Jr. is up in there. He ain't live scoping. No, no, I'd say Ramus. He's, Ramus he's not. He's got 17 pounds. He's got him a jig or a Carolina rig or maybe a spinnerbait or something in there. Maybe he, he might be throwing a chatter on some grass. Yeah. He might be throwing chatter on some grass. So uh, what is this? Uh Oh, Hatfield's on the tear, so he's been fishing well last year and this year. 
what do you two think about Trey McKinney? His stats are insane. What do you think he does differently than any other? Thing? I'm not going to lie to you, Nathan. I don't know who Trey McKinney is. You'll you'll know him next year. This year, what's he do? He's going to fish the elites. Okay. Yeah, I don't I don't know who that is. Uh, I, so my deal is this: I'm I get real honest about all this stuff. This isn't against Trey. It's just against. Um, like Drew Gill's going to catch them as long as they keep on letting live scope be a thing. Yeah. And that's not a knock on Drew Gill. Like, man, there's, I'm a, I'm a great sight fisherman. As long as I'm allowed to sight fish, I'm going to do really good in the springtime. David Mullins is really good at cranking. If they took crank baits away from him, he can still catch them without a crankbait. Don't get me wrong. But there are certain things we're all good at. Live scope's one of them for certain some people. As long live scope translates, though, that like if they want to compare it to the Alabama rig, it's not even close to the Alabama rig. It's, Alabama yeah. rig is one is a, is one technique. It, and it's one bait. Live scope is an entire different thing with a thousand different baits. Like it's limitless, and so you yeah. can go to any lake, almost in the country, and and figure out how to do live scope. Mullins can't come down to Lake Livingston and throw a freaking deep dive and crankbait because a bass doesn't live in eight foot of water. Like that's the deepest they'll ever go. Yeah. Right. And so like, and I can't go sight fish 12 months out of the year. Right. So he'll do good. What I'm interested in, what you'll, what you'll notice in my opinion, I got to plug this up. I'll be right back. What, what I'll notice in my opinion, and you can take, it's this is not an exact science, so don't think I'm talking about anyone in particular. But I do believe when you when you watch guys move from the opens to the elites, the guys that make it, a, and it's not even the opens to the elites. It, it was from it could be from the tour to the elites when they did that or whatever. There are guys that struggled. Um, struggling a year is not a big deal when you start to see a a trend. I would I would say the trend is information. When when you have information cut out, and they do a, and we can ask Mullins about this, and I I think he'd agree that 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 you didn't get to hear my last part. So I, heard I, heard it, I heard it. I heard it. I heard it. I heard it. I was listening. I I would say that that if you see a guy struggling, not for a year, because dude, rookie struggle. Think like people have good and bad years. Um. You could and and so the story Mullins just told about him going from basically angler of the year to the next year not doing good. <laughs> like it, nowhere on the stats does it show Mullins freaking troll motor going out and then and then his motor going out in the first term and him zeroing. Like nowhere in the stats does it show that it doesn't have a star next to that. Yeah. Um, I I had for a lot of years I could have stars where it's like motor breakdowns. And a lot of anglers can do that. So I'm saying, but over time, you'll see where, man, maybe some guy got a lot of information for a long time because it was allowed and then stopped getting it and they weren't as dominant. I'm not saying this about Trey. I'm saying about this. I like to look at that group of fishermen that come from the opens and do good in the elites. So because, and, and I bring this up now, the opens are different. Because we used to have opens to get in the to get in the elites, it was three three tournaments. So you would see a guy that ran a small boat and got to fish two out of three rivers and did good, and then get in the elites and doesn't do as good because it's not like. So I I've always said, even though I think it's harder for guys, um, for for the regular person to go qualify for the elites, I've always said that the nine the nine lake, the nine tournament deal is a better representation of what, of preparing you for the elites. But I'm very interested to see that group who catches them and, and who struggles. And I'm not wishing that upon anyone, but I mean, I'm, I'm, like I said, I, I talked about my dad Mullins the other day about like, I didn't understand why he watched golf. And I asked about him one time, I'm like, why do you like watching golf? And he's like, man, I can't wait till Sundays. He said, I just like to see the people that fold under the pressure. And I'm like, yeah. really? That's why you watch golf? He's like, yeah, man, I just want to see who who like can't take it. 
uh, I'll throw I'll throw my opinion on this, and I don't like giving it out a whole lot, but I will on this deal. And this is only this is only live to a bunch of people, so it's okay. So, and I'm looking at this as David Mullins. Okay, if they would have had this nine, and I'm a I, and guys, if you know me, I'm a, an exception to the fishing rule in a lot of ways because I you're you're talking about somebody that grew up. I'm 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 blue collar as can be, but we didn't have an over excess amount of money to do anything. So when I was, I just got a school teaching job. Okay. And Aaron Mark, this is, and it, it, some people's already heard this story. Well, we'll I'll try to go through it quickly, but like Aaron Martin's encouraged me to fish the opens with him after he come up here and fish with me a couple of times before in the league series. So the, 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 the back in them days, like Todd was saying, you know, you had, you had three divisions. And if you finished in the top five in those divisions, you got to qualify for the leads. So I took time out of my teaching deal and I worked it out with the principal and I told him before he hired me, I was like, listen, I've already got these opens. I've got a fish next spring scheduled. And, and can I, can, can you let me off of those? And he said, yeah, we'll work it out. So I got to fish those opens and qualified to those opens the first year I tried doing it through the Southerns and I finished in the top five and I, and, and still fishing the elites 11 years later. But what I'm getting at is I don't think David Mullins could, could do it fishing nine tournaments and I know he couldn't do it. So I, I, I don't like the fact that they're going to nine tournaments and that's how you qualify. I don't like that because I couldn't have done that. Is it going to make a better fisherman out of the box coming in? Yes. I agree with you a hundred percent. It's going to make a better fisherman coming in. Yes. Was I, uh, as good a fisherman when I first started as I am now? No. But I mean, my rookie year, I think I got five checks my rookie year, which is pretty stout. I don't even know what grass is, Todd. I don't know how to fish grass. We go to these grass, like, I don't even know nothing about grass. The only thing I heard about grass, mom said, stay away from it. You know, don't be smoking no grass. That's all we knew about grass. So uh, I, I don't know if I'm ever able to do it, you know, and that's why I say I, I'm blessed to be able to do this, man, because I'm. I, I, <laughs> If you look at the people that's put in my life at the right time for fishing with Charlie Rash locally, which is probably the best fisherman that's ever fished Cherokee and Douglas, to be able to – he never fished with anybody. Uh, to be able to fish with him for 10 years, to be to, – to, to meet Aaron Martins uh, at a five-minute uh, conversation on a ramp at Douglas Lake when I'm 18 years old changed my life completely, just five minutes. If I'm not there for that conversation, I'm probably not talking to you right now. Right. So there's certain things in my life. I've been so blessed to do what I'm doing. There's so many things that uh, if it didn't work out the right way, and that's why I say I feel sorry for people who who want to do it. They can only fish three terms. I think that's, oh. totally, that's totally letting them out of the bag. It's totally against them. And there is people that can qualify, you know, that only fishes three that can make a living doing it. So, and you know, for, for a, for a long time, I hated the fact that even me saying, you know, fishing's a freaking uh, rich man sport. Come on, man, get out of here. It ain't a rich man sport. But the way things are, are and, 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 and right now as, as our economy and you see which way Americans going, man, it takes a freaking lot of money to do it right now. Well, I, 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 and I, so let me finish this. I look at a kid now, okay, and he pulls up to the ramp. And he's got a 2024 jacked up diesel pulling with a brand new boat. We're not in the same category. You know, he, he does not understand job. He does not understand money at this point. I don't care how it, you, you just don't. Cause when I pulled up at the ramp at that age, I was pulling an 85 Silverado. I had to borrow from dad. To, he even let me go to the ramp. I had a 1981 bass tracker with a 50 on the back. And that's where I learned to fish at. So it is it is changing a little bit, and I don't like the way it's changing, but I just feel sorry for the guys that can only fish three opens and they can't work. So, so I've I've always been that so listen, I've I am I am very opinionated, not publicly, but privately. So if some people every once in a while ask about somebody, every once in a while I have people, and this isn't about anyone, no one's asked today, but every once in a while someone will ask about somebody and I don't respond. I don't even acknowledge when they ask me because I can't give their, my opinion because my opinion is not probably favorable in theirs. Because like I said, I, there are guys in this invitational that have never 
that ha- that I fished against for a couple years on Rayburn or fished against in general. I don't even I don't even know why I brought up Rayburn in general. And they pull up and they're totally freaking giant wrap truck and boat and stuff. And I'm like, dude, I've never seen you cash a check in five years, much less. And they're in this invitational right now. They had they had money. And there's nothing wrong with having money. No. But I was just going, you know, that wasn't I, I didn't look at you like that didn't impress me at all. I was always impressed by the guys that could catch them a certain way. And yeah, yeah I mean, my my whole thing with live scope, like I like I love live scope. I think it's awesome, right? However, I am right there with anyone that said about the money part of it. Cause I was and they were like, Well, live scope's not that expensive. Like a lot of people say that. And I'm like, hey, look. To you, it's not. Yeah. But when it, I would not, if I always said, I get to do a pretty good job right now. I, I get to travel around and fish. It, I, I work for Strike King Design and Baits. I do, I do, I kind of make my own schedule, right? None of y'all even have really a chance to do that. I get to do that. Um, when I do all that, and I, I, I am here now because of I grew up 20 something years ago. If I grew up now and had to try to make it now, there's no way because I always tell everyone, I just had to have a boat that barely ran and have a troll motor. Yeah. I could beat someone fishing, but I couldn't have beat them with power poles, side imaging, live scope now. Like I wouldn't have been able to afford all that. I mean, I barely had enough with my old truck, my old boat to like fish. And so I feel for the guy that wants to like, it's hard for, I couldn't see myself making it now just like you like we look at it a certain way and like listen a lot of people don't see it that way and that's fine but for us that's the way we see it yeah and you know to do this you cannot respect your money at all and i've learned like you know i can have a amount of money in this hand and and be a large amount of money and then like three days later that money's gone so you can't you can't respect (laughs) you can't respect money you've got to be able to but let a lot of go to do this, you know, and that's yeah. just, that's not the same with the entropies. And that's where, you know, I get such, I get such debated on the future of, of tournament fishing. And I, I look at, and the way I, the way I try to explain it to people is if you're, if you're looking at tournament fishing and say, let's, let's say you get hired on in, in 1999 or 2001. Okay. And this company is paying you $35,000 a year. And you fast forward to 2024 and that company's paying you $28,000 a year. Are you going to still hang in there? And that's the way about professional bass fishing is if you look a hundred thousand dollar purse back in 2001 at an $1,800 entry fee, you know, or $2,000 entry fee. Now we've got a $5,000 entry fee and still got a hundred thousand dollars. We've got the same thing. I don't understand why people don't look at that. And and I don't understand why, why, um, you can't, why, where, where's, where's money going that we cannot do better in our payouts and our pay scale and do more for our anglers? Because, you know, it, it, it's getting to the point now you can't hard to make a living just off your stick. You got to have a pretty good sponsor base, you know? And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I, I did it for so many, I, I would say 10 to 12 years. I did it, you know, 95% of the money I made was from fishing tournaments. But I, I made it, I would, I was making a living, but I wasn't like, it, it was, I couldn't, it was hard to save. Like it, you know, it was hard to like, it was hard to grow with the success I was getting. It was like, I was getting enough just to, not just to fish the next year, but yes. I mean, it was, it wasn't like, it, it was a very, very, very slow climb. Yeah. Doing it that way. And now it's gotten worse because like everything's gotten more expensive, but I'm still fishing kind of for the same amount of money. Yeah, actually, right. you're probably you're probably fishing for less if you can see um, the cost of living and everything else. And that's what I, you know, if they, you want, they, yes, they talked about, you know, we're still fishing for hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, man, you know, you can't go remodel your bathroom anymore for a hundred thousand dollars. And I, and I, it's just, and I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not trying to like down. I don't know how to explain that, but I'm just saying that's not, if you, if you learn about money nowadays, like 10 grand is not very much money. You know, you can't hardly do much with 10 grand anymore. And it's just like, I wish, I wish there was more to improve. And we're not downplaying 10 grand. 
no, no, dude. You know what I'm saying? It's just, yeah, but it's, it's not just, like it's it's. But ten grand is not what it was 15 years ago. I mean, if you look at a tournament, you're gonna pay five thousand dollar entry fee. You're gonna have a thousand some dollars in your in your lodging. You're gonna have over a thousand some dollars in gas and stuff yeah. going there and food. And there you're looking there, you're already about nine thousand dollars. So if you if you win ten, you you got you a grand in the bank, you know. And and then if and then if you don't get a check, you lost nine, and you're about to spend nine on the next one. So then yeah. you're down eighteen. You win ten grand, you're still down eight. Yeah. So it's it's just you know I hope it improves, but I don't like the I don't like the way everything's going. I, and but anyway, you I, this know, is I'm a, blessed to be able to do it. I'm not this, not going to say it's bad, but I'm just saying it's it's not an easy living. And I was like, when I made the elites, I'm under pressure. Like, heck yes, I made the freaking elites. I'm going to get some sponsors. I'm going to get some reels. And that was in 2014 was my first year. Fast forward to 2019. I'm still using the same reels that I bought with my money from 2001. Still using them in rotation. You know, and it and it just not everything like people think you get to the elites and like everything's given to you. It's not. You still got to work for it. And dude, you know, I. I've been blessed to have the right people in my life. And it's just like, I have not, for me, I've never done any good by going out and asking for a sponsorship from anybody. The only, the only people that's ever supported me is the people I knew or I've met. And I hate doing shows. I hate going to shows, but listen, I've always met people at shows. I never asked them for anything, but I've met people at shows that end up helping me down the line. Yep, that's what I always tell people like I've never I've never asked a certain person anyone for a sponsorship. I just I just like I it's about relate it's about relationships. Relationships, man. but yeah. I I want to respond to this one comment. Okay, now I would say six months ago I was scared to comment on this a little bit. This is not an opinion. Okay, it, it it's an opinion. It's it's an opinion that what I'm going to say. I'm sure the younger younger anglers can catch fish with or without live scope. That is 100% false. Now, it says younger guys. Yes, there are some younger guys that can fish with or without it. That's not what... And But I'm going to say this. And this is literally... I said it earlier. It's not an opinion because it will come from their mouth. There are guys out there. One of them, I know... He's not even bashful about it. He will tell you he has not caught a fish without live scope in the, like the last two years. He's like, man, any fish I've ever seen, like if I've caught a fish, I've looked at it on live scope. And he's like, if they took it away, they are honest about it. I have no pro. Like, I respect those guys. They're like, man, it is what it is, right? They're, they're like, I'm not that good without it. And granted, they're probably going to be in the top 10 in this event. Because they're like, yeah, it. Because they look, they don't look at it like we do. They're sitting there going, yeah, we're allowed to do it. We're gonna do it. It, it is what it is. I'm gonna get really good at it, and I'm gonna make a bunch of top tens. And he's probably like, if they ever ban it, then I'll deal with it when it comes. But for right now, if you're sitting around waiting for them to ban it, you might be waiting around for 20 years, and you're gonna get left behind, right? Or, or what I'm saying is, and so no, there are. Tons of guys that you can disagree with me all you want to. I will stand on the top of the hill and scream this. There are tons of guys you take live scope away. There is a good chance they don't make checks in tournaments for the next 10 years. I don't care. What, I'm not saying all of them and I'm not saying younger fishermen. I'm just saying there are guys. If you took that thing away, they, 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 it's, it's not going to be good for them. Cause a lot of guys were saying, Oh, if you took it away from Jacob Wheeler, you know, he would still catch fish. So that's where we're going with this. The Like maybe the number one fisherman in the country right now. Well, of course, of course, Wheeler also spent 10 years dominating a bunch of people without it. He just got really good with it too. But I'm talking about like, there's other guys that you've never heard of in your entire life. And all of a sudden live scope popped up and they're freaking can catch a fish now. And I'm just telling you, they would never have caught. They would. They, they would struggle. You back up to the other comment. Said something about the information. Did you see the difference pre no info rule in the elites? I won't name any names, but the Cherokee Elite tournaments for reference. 
there was a rumor going around that here locally that someone traded. Listen, uh, I have seen this firsthand. Like, I'm a big com promoter and supporter of no information ever. As soon as the date is announced, I don't think you should get any help. And I, and that goes back to, like, I didn't know how bad this was. And there's guys on the Elite Series that, that, that still – really really want information back and i'm i do not want it back and there's guys that that fish that's won elite series tournaments now that don't do very good because they don't get the help that they did and i think that's a lot to do with it and but i never knew how bad it was till we went to cherokee and we had an official pre-practice in cherokee and i might have went one or one or two days in that and every elite series guy that I saw in that in, in pre-practice rode with a local and everybody that fished in front of me in that tournament fished with a local. I finished seventh in that deal. Everybody in front of me fished with a local several times, got all kinds of information, got every hole that they could give them. And, I, and I'm explaining to guys, listen, you don't need to be giving them these places to fish because I might be wanting to fish it. And dude, I, you know, I roll up to a spot, there's somebody fishing. And this is how bad I knew about it in, in practice the first day of practice i get to the ramp like i'm first one at the ramp and i roll around hit a couple sneaky places i go to this this getting a little bit later in the day and i go around this corner to a place that i'm, that I'm like more jacking right here there's a guy sitting on it there is no possible way that you can find that on your own no possible way it ain't on a map it's just there and there's a guy sitting on it so i'm a little bit later i'm going to the back of this creek going back in this creek there's another guy sitting on a place that I was like, there is no possible way that you found that, you know, on that, on that. So that's when I learned right there that like, it's amazing. I, I couldn't, that was in 17 and I've been on the elite series three or four years by then. And it was amazing how much help those guys got. I'm like, I'm behind in, because I don't, I have no network. I have nobody to talk to. I wouldn't know who to call to get help at any of these lakes I'd ever went to. So I, I'm like, I'm, I don't know how I ever get a check because I'm so far behind the eight ball when I show up. All these guys know what's going on before they even put their boat in the, in the water. So, yeah, I, I could see a big difference between the pre-no-information rule and the post-no-information rule. And I think if you're a professional angler, you didn't have to worry about any points or well, I, riding with somebody. I don't th I've always said this, and I don't think – that's why I'm a big – I think the professional angler is the biggest, biggest joke. The actual calling someone a professional angler. I, I said that back when the tour was going on, when all you had to do was pay your money and you were a professional. Um, you didn't have to qualify for it. I still think to this day, it, it, it cracks me up that you're that professional anglers. They can't wait to say, like, look at all my sponsors and look at my, my name and my, I drive a big truck and big boat and all this stuff and I'm wrapped everywhere and I'm, and I can't wait to tell everyone I'm a professional and tell everyone how to fish, but tell everyone what to do. Yeah. And as soon as that, and as soon as that's over, I'm going to make 30 phone calls and ask all these non-professionals, all these locals around the lake to help me figure out how to catch a fish. Mm -hmm. You're a prof And please Mullins tell these people. And I'm not saying when I say these people, it's just like that comment on there about like, man, if you took, forward facing sonar away from people they're, like they'd still know how to catch a fish whatever people think they know about professionals and or tournament fishermen and information and the information they got whatever they think they know they're way off like if they think it's going on if they thought there was if they think it's whatever they think it is it's it's times 10 what it's really is because we, we in the industry and we that see it all the time on both sides, it's happened against me. And then I've been sitting in a room when people get phone calls and I'm listening to the conversations. I've been, I've been in the truck with someone and when the elites got canceled and they moved it to whatever lake it was when it flooded in Oklahoma. Yeah. And he, and he gets three phone calls within a matter of 10 minutes from elite guys. Yeah. No, off there. The tournament starts in two days, and they moved it. And he's getting phone calls left and right. And I'm like, they they ain't asking to stay at your house. And that was a, that was in the opens, huh? That was in the opens or the if that was an elite event. Elite event. Yeah. Well, 
here, you know, I'm going to comment on it. And I, I Dude, never, people I, have no clue. People have no clue. And I'm not going to lie. I probably don't either because I've never been around it and I've never seen it firsthand. So I'm not going to comment on somebody if I'm speculating somebody else is cheating because I, the only time that I've ever experienced that, somebody called me from an FLW tournament that was fishing the lake locally here and asked me for asked me for information. And I asked the guy, I said, isn't this in your off limits? And he said, no. So I told him some stuff. Then I get a call from another guy that wasn't calling me for information. He was calling me about a place to stay. And I said, yeah. And I said, you need to check this area. He said, dude, we can't get information. I said, no, wait a minute. Somebody else just called me an hour ago, told me that you could get information. Anyway, so that guy figured out who was, ended up DQing the guy. Yeah, he did. Well, so. I, this, no, I know who it was. No one knows about this. Yeah, and I've never spoken about it. And no, I don't no, know. No, I don't know. Name names. I know. I know. I'm saying I know about it. I don't know if they were DQ'd, first off. Yeah. DQ to me is you pay your money and you get your money back. Yeah. I'll bet a hundred bucks that he got his money back and was just asked not to fish. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and, maybe, I, and, here, and I want to tell I want to tell this part of the story that no one knows about. The next event. Okay. We worked, we worked the booth. So we worked the booth at registration for Costa. And we're sitting there and there was a, there was a sponsor there. She knew what went down. Yeah. And when he came through, she asked him like, Hey, I didn't see you at the last event. And he was like, Oh, he, he made up some story. He had no idea that he, when he, when he said that story that she actually knew the truth. Yeah. And we sat there going, just straight lied to her face. And she just nodded her head and went on. And I, I say that because I bring this up because I've been with, I've been in rooms with sponsors and different people and things happen. I've seen stuff happen on the water and like, I've, and they're like, they go about it, all this stuff. And I'm like, Hey, you do realize who that was right there? Yeah. So good, good luck with them ever again. Cause you just, you just showed out like your true colors and that yeah. was a sponsor and i was like so every time you're on the lake and y'all do certain things man there's always someone watching and there i'm just telling you it happens a lot and people have yeah, no clue. i've never experienced and i've roomed with uh with amart for a long time and and then i've ever since then i've roomed with drew benton and i i can't ever name a time that that drew has ever done anything in front of me that i thought broke a rule or, or talked about in, in front of me so i and dude i don't talk to many people i mean like there's like three or four people i talk to that's that's everybody thinks we know i don't know hardly anybody on the league series still this day because the only time we see each other is in the weighing back yeah when uh, you see each other you don't see you don't get to spend time with anybody i probably know more of them than you do you probably do because i don't and, mind talking to me because it's different a little bit and i you know and it's not it's not that i'm I don't like everybody. It's just we don't ever have time to talk to each other. So I don't know. I don't. I don't know a lot of them. But I'm just telling you, from my experience, I've never seen anybody, and I'm sure it goes on. But from my experience with the people I've been around, the people I've room with, I've never experienced anybody getting off getting information or or cheat. I've never. Yeah. Experienced that. I, now, I honestly, I think it happened a lot more back in the day than it does now. And I don't think it happened. Was. In but, the elites, in the elites, I think. I think a lot of more of the the I would say more it happened more ten years ago than it way does now in the elites. And and this is my this is my gonna be another opinion that I'm gonna put out. If somebody is caught, okay, let's say let's say you're caught you're caught with steroids in the NFL or steroids in Major League Baseball. That is that is announced. Everybody knows what happens, and that guy has to sit out. Okay. If you're caught cheating or failing a polygraph, that should be announced. I agree. And, and the penalty should be more. And to discourage this ever happening again. So I I'm, I don't know how organizations run this, whatever else. But if a guy has failed a polygraph, there should be a penalty. There should be a sit-out time. And there should be a consequence for what he just did. You know, that was wrong. So, I, I don't, like, again, I'm not going to say names about I, – I don't know. Who's failed what? I'm just saying, if I'm looking at that, that way, 
that's going to calm some of that down. That way his sponsors know well, what he's doing. That way, that way, you know, everything's smoothed over and you're not getting a podcast from a former uh, lie detector guy that's telling everybody that all these people are failing. Let's, let's, as an organization, let's stand up, let's have some, let's have some, you know, uh, kahunas about us and we're going to name out this and we're going to keep this from happening. We're going to keep our organization well, straight. So, someone asked me, someone asked me, I think I did live a couple of days ago and said, how would you fix it? And I was like, and I shook my head thinking, God, like how, how would I, like I had, to th I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, wait a minute. It's, it's easily fixable. Yeah. I was like, what do you, what I was trying to think about this way because I was trying to think of, because it's fixable if you just do what you just said. The problem was I was trying to think of a way to do it because I know that's not going to be done. That's the problem. It's it would be fixed instantly if they just freaking did what you just said. But we know that they're they've showed us for 20 years that that they're or 30 for however that they're not going to do that. So if they're not going to do that, I was trying to think of another way to do it. But I'm like, yeah, it it would stop guys if they if they started this. And I'm not. And what sucks is, is you want to know why they can't do it now? You, it's the death penalty. Yeah. Because they've let it go on for so long that, that right now, if someone gets caught, you're, you're like, you might be banished from the sport. You know, it's almost like the Epstein deal where this guy is, is, is convicted of sex trafficking to people, but nobody knows who, like he, who did he sex traffic to? There's never been names released, you know. I, yeah. If you're, and so so he's been penalized, but we don't know why. Right. But at, least, at least he got put in jail or some kind of consequence. It's like, you know, this is all rumor, so I don't know. It's just like if somebody does something bad, there's no consequence. So well, I, no, and, and like I said, it, and they let it go on for so long. You're like, and, and that was there's been a couple guys that have kind of gotten. They didn't get a bad rap. They got what they deserved, but it made a lot of other fishermen mad that someone got in trouble. Right. And then they were looking at this other guy going, this guy did this 20 times before. Yeah. And he didn't get in trouble at all. And this guy got, did it I'm not saying he did it once, but they're looking around going, well, man, he should have been like this 20 other times, but now you, like, so I said it, someone's going to have to be the scapegoat, but if it happens, it would solve it all. And if it started in, and, and a lot of the times it's like, well, you know, and I think it happens with every sport, depending on who you are is depends on if you're going to be the one that gets punished bad. Yeah. Right, right. There's going to be guys that like, well, he's, it's going to be harder for them to punish a star than, than not. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, what you, you hate that. The polygrapher said the MLF, it would ruin guys' careers not to release the info. That's not from the polygraph guy. The polygraph, oh, okay, I'm sorry, said that in MLF. I was about to say, correct. We have been hearing the same thing over and over again. That's not the polygrapher. I know you didn't say that. You said, said MLF said that. That's what these guys have said. They don't. From the organizations have said it from day one. They they don't want to ruin a guy's career. They're not ruining a guy's career. They're not. The angler is who's doing it. They are not. But yeah, the organization keeps saying it. Yeah. And then they and then they find Watson for like Watson. Did you listen to that polygraph thing? No. Uh -uh. Well, I so everyone on here. There was tons of people that. Uh, that got on here and told me to go watch it. And I don't watch stuff like that, but I went, I went and watched basically the whole thing. And uh, it was so funny when he gets on there and he was talking about it all. And I don't want to get into it because it was really good, but, and he doesn't talk about lying and telling the truth. That's not what he says. He doesn't view it that way. He views yeah. it as he's very sophisticated. And like he looks at spikes and things like that and what, what triggers certain things. And, and, and he gives examples of like what you have to do to like protect the president. You have to have a certain a plus, you know, nine or eight, whatever it might be. Right. And then there's negatives. If you're negative, you're, it's really bad, but you have to be a certain part to like protect the president. He was like, he named off 
two people that he said because trade asked like give me some names of some anglers that like scored really high james watson and ishman Monroe came with the two names i heard him say yeah and but it's yeah. funny and then watson's the one that gets fined yeah yeah so yeah and i like james oh yeah but all right we've been, we've been on long I, enough but I, i'll leave you this man i do a daily devotion now and, and i'll leave you with proverbs 11 12 a man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor but a man of understanding holds his tongue and there's a lot of situations now where there's you know a lot of negativity out there and a lot of people put their opinion out there that listen just be quiet let it ain't for you to have. It's it's like Proverbs twenty three seventeen. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for fear of the Lord. And you look at that. It it ain't it ain't for us to judge somebody else. And that's probably why you know I don't do a lot of I used to do a lot of funny videos and stuff. And that's probably the biggest reason why I don't do a lot of them. It ain't for me to point out judgment, and it ain't for me to make fun of somebody, even though it's probably true or what I'm making fun of is true. It ain't my, none of my business. So it's just like, just keep your focus on what you can do, the things you can control, and and uh, you know, love God, and everything's gonna work out. So I'll leave well, y'all. And, and and I don't, I don't really. Uh, when I say like, I stopped holding my opinion a long time ago. What what I'll say it, but I don't like. I don't think anyone on here can really say sit there and say I talk bad about and it, anyone. It ain't necessarily opinion, but it's judging somebody else. You know, and I'm not saying so, you're doing that. I'm just saying this is the this is the right. nature down for my hourly study every day and yeah i don't really if hit so, home to me so it might help somebody else th there's some guys on youtube that that like try to um you know get clicks and do certain things here and there and all that yeah. stuff like i don't i try to stay away from that and just do my own thing yeah but i but i i have as i get older i i don't hold my tongue anymore to like that there's that there's situations out there that people don't understand so like if tournament organizations aren't they're like hey how come you know like kind of giving more insight as to like what's actually going on out there it's not against anybody per se it's yeah. just like hey why are they doing this and i'm like well y'all are being misled a lot of information and here's the information we know and yeah. that's why even you weren't here at the very start of this is that i started this entire this is a great way to end i started this entire thing saying that i would I was going to kind of talk about what I think might happen at Rayburn, but I don't like doing that because I'm scared to death that I think it should be one live scope and everything. And then, and then like top tens, all guys throwing rattle traps. Like I'm way off. Yeah. I started the whole episode saying I'm always shocked that, that news reporters can get up on the news. Right. And this happened three years ago. And I think everyone knows what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to say, it. but like, and they would say all these like horrendous things. You know, I, everyone's going to, you know, fall over dead and all these different things. And and then like a year later, none of it was true. Yeah. And no one got in trouble. No one had to make an apology. Like so many people just, oh, well, he said it and who cares anymore? Because I'm always like, hey, when we say it, it's recorded right now, right? It's live. So I, I'm always just one to sit sit there and go, man, I, I want to, um, I don't ever want to say something that I, that I'm not hundred percent sure on. Right. So, so a lot of the stuff we talk about there's, we might not s name names or say, but like, I don't want to sit there and go say some of the stuff I've been saying. And then like six months later, someone's like, well, that didn't happen, Todd. Well, I don't have that come back and bite me. Cause like, I'll say stuff, but I know it's true. Like I know these things are going on and I just want to let everyone else know. Cause if I, all I did was say all these things and some guy six months later is like, see, you weren't right. I'm like, yeah, don't ever listen to me ever again. But until that happens, <laughs> maybe I'm right. May, maybe listen to Watson. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you can find a hole in Watson's story, call him out on it. But guess what? No one ever finds a hole in Watson's story. Right. In fact, it might be the opposite. It might have been so good that he got in trouble for it. <laughs> I don't know the details, but like I said, I, I try to keep my business and myself focused well, on myself and do the best I can. I'll put it to you this way. I bet you he didn't get fined for, for lying. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put it to you that. I bet you what he, I bet you the fine wasn't because he lied about something. Yeah. Right. 
You know what I'm saying? Because if he lied about something, I'd be, they would have just shut, slept it off. But, yeah, we'll end it at that. Well, dude, enjoyed it. If you need anything, holler. All right, hold on. God bless everybody.